Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much, Evan. Thank you, everyone. As you will have guessed, I am the Jim of the Jim and Deb Fellows duo. Deb and I will be taking turns talking for the next while. I just have to say what an honor and joy it is for us to be back in Redlands on this day, this day of renewal. Renewal despite the snow on the mountains, despite the rain early on. I say back in Redlands because this is the town where I grew up and I still think of as home. This is the town where Deb has been coming for more than 50 years. She was certified as a Redlander, and so she, we, we feel as if we are our home. And I just have to say, Deb and I have seen a number of ceremonies, a number of universities over the long decades, even back to my alma mater of Oxford starting in 1096 when I was first enrolling there. This was, this was an exceptional moment. I think we all should just take a moment to clap for not, simple, not only for our new president, Krista Newkirk, but for everybody who was involved in this fabulous ceremony. It really was, was wonderful. So congratulations. So maybe we'll get the clock going. Yes. Um, the, the theory of Red Talks and TED Talks to time, the and this, this right. countdown clock has not started running. So Deb is going to the stage business. This is the way we cooperate and, and collaborate. Of the many things that struck us this morning, including the wonderful address by President Newkirk, one that I wanted to mention now, just in setting up what Deb is going to talk about, is the comment by uh, Kay Thomas, who is saying, who is likening uh, the work of any community or any organization to that of a body. And she sort of summed up the uh, lessons of that analogy, as I will uh, condense them, as saying you have to know what your role is, and then you have to do it. For my purposes, I'm going to have a slight alteration of that in introducing Deb, saying that what we're going to be talking about now is in the role of civic life at the community level and at the national level, there are the, the challenges of recognizing reality and doing something about it. And Deb and I will be talking, and Deb, Deb will be talking mainly about the doing something about it um, business, and I'll talk at the end about, about the recognition. What we're going to be saying to you, the simple idea of our talk, is it's time to recognize the importance of local institutions, uh, from libraries, Deb will discuss, to educational institutions, to many others, in addressing the problems we're all so familiar with at the national level um, in our country. Uh, part of the premise of, and I'll say too that, that the background of this, uh, of what we're going to say to you is this project Deb and I have been doing for the last almost decade now, traveling around the country looking at smaller town and rural America and saying, what do people say there if you don't start out by asking about national politics? And in this whole process, um, Redlands has been central uh, to it. It's, it is, uh, it's where we wrote our book, as Evan mentioned, at 811 University Street. It's a lead-off sector in the, in the H HBO movie, and it's, uh, it's been you know, a, the grounding we've had in our minds of how communities can, can function. And the main point we're going to be making to you is that this American moment, at the national level and the local level, there is something that Kay Thomas would describe as a failure of the first part of that two-part bargain or, or outline. There is a failure to recognize what the actual situation of the American public is, by which I mean there are national-level problems about which we are all hyper-aware and we should be aware, and that is part of the national saga at the moment. But there is relative unawareness of the response to so many of those problems that's happening around the country in smaller places that are not on the evening news, that are not uh, you know, uh, dominating the internet. And so uh, we're, there are reasons why for this difference in, in awareness of what's going on, but it's an important one to recognize because over the course of history, things that have started small have often become big and it's worth paying attention to some of those things that are starting small and have the potential to be very big in the future of our communities, the future of our nation, the future of our world. So the plan is I'm going to turn the stage over to Deb in just a moment and she's going to tell you about some of those practicalities, some of those doings that are happening around America. And then I'm going to tell you a little more after that about some of the extensions that involve indeed the mission of the University of Redlands. I give you Deborah Fellows. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for being here. 
We heard a lot this morning from President Newkirk and others about the, the strength of community and the promise of change at the university. And I want to talk about another institution that has strength and promise and in communities all around the country that we have seen and also in Redlands. And that is the public library, the institution of the public library. We know that public libraries are more than providers of books and information, and they're more than providers of programs, like uh, author programs or, or storytelling, and they're more than their collaborations, the sum of the parts of those. I'd like to talk about the libraries in, from very briefly on four different roles that they play in the community. Libraries as civic actors, libraries as the stewards of history and the keepers of the modern flame, libraries as the equalizers in education, and libraries as places of trust. Civic actors, especially during COVID, this has been really highlighted. We've seen in Erie, Pennsylvania, and in Burlington, Vermont, that the librarians and the staff were called into the city government, partly to respond to the tsunami of questions that came in. Where do I find a mask? Where do I get a test? Where do I get a vaccination? And partly as as the researchers for COVID tracking when people called in to try to trace where COVID was going. In um, Anchorage, Alaska, the library gave its, its place and its wide broadband access over to the city government when they, when they were overwhelmed and didn't have enough room to operate. It's also a, a great provider for the communities at large of broadband. We know this. People are, go to broadband and, and during, um, during COVID, when remote learning was necessary, kids, libraries would keep themselves open after hours all night in the parking lot so parents could bring their kids there to, to study. And they would hand, send, hand, hand out hotspots or Chromebooks, and they would help people with doing their telehealth. Libraries as a, uh, um, a strength of the town history. Now this is where Redlands really steps in. There is a trifecta here in the Redlands Public Library. We know about the Lincoln Shrine, which is a real testament to the philanthropy that's, that is a heart and soul of this community. When, when um, the Watchhorns gave all of their Lincoln memorabilia and created the shrine and the library now watches over it. Similarly, under production right now, the Museum of Redlands, which will be a great asset to the community, is going to be turned over to the library to, to watch. And for current status, you've got this fourth grade heritage tour, which I would love to go on one day, where every student in the fourth grade in the Redland Public Schools goes around to see all of the points of history and bring it home and become the participants in it themselves. Um, all of that is done through the library. In, in um, the great equalizer of education, there is a, a mission of librarians to reach as many people as possible for the kids there was a mayor in Nashville, Tennessee, who said, every child who enrolls in our public schools will, re will receive a library card. And not, they can order books to be delivered to the schools. For a lot of families, it's not possible to go to the libraries themselves. And Redlands is under the same kind of operations now, where they're going into the schools to give the kids all the library cards. Um, from, from San Jose to Alabama, we've seen libraries eliminating their fines, which is, which is critical for the, for the community of people that they want because it's mostly the underserved community who are turning away from the libraries because they're afraid their kids are going to lose the books or have to pay steep fines. For the adults, again, Redlands is a real example of this for their adult literacy program. Hard to imagine in this room, but you can imagine adults who do not know how to read and the courage and strength that says to them to go into the library as a place of trust and say, please teach me how to read, which the libraries do. Um, and for the top end of that, the entrepreneurs who can find their way to have home offices and maker spaces, which again, the Redlands Library is making. If they don't, they have the ideas, but they don't have the resources so they can go to the library to find them. The library is a place of trust this is the one that really touches my heart the most. I've seen in countless libraries, people going in to ask the librarians, can you just tell me what this spot is on my arm? The, and they're not trained medical cert certified people, 
But in Tucson, Arizona, there's a nurse, book a nurse program. Come in for half an hour a day and find out for a nurse how to lead you on. In Bend, Oregon, book a lawyer program, same thing. In the Bronx, a librarian told me about a young man who came in and said, I have a relative who's passed away. I don't know what to do. I can't afford a funeral. Please help me figure out how to bury this person. Um, so in just one more shout out to the community of Redlands itself. Besides the public library, there are many public institutions in town that are operating this way. The YMCA as a source for mental and physical and emotional health, and plus they have a circus. Who has a circus? <laughs> the YMCA has a circus. The Redlands Bowl providing cultural experience to everyone in town. All these inaugural events like the tree plantings with the students in town, the bike rides and the festivals. All of these are a way for the community to knit itself together in civic strength with all these, these different efforts. Thank you, and here's Jim back. <laughs> so you can see why Redlands and the University of Redlands are pl proud to have Deb as a, as a member of their community, as am I. So uh, I'm gonna just wrap up quickly by mentioning one other aspect. You know, I started out saying there's a problem of correctly perce perceiving what our situation is and then doing on it. And Deb was talking about people who are doing it at the local level. I'm gonna talk about one other as aspect of perception and doing that's directly, directly related to President Newkirk's speech today. That is higher education. It is now a commonplace to say that higher education is the natural resources of this era. In other eras, oil and timber and gold and coal and things like that were very important for regional development. They still matter, but higher education really has the leverage. I will contend that our perception of higher education and national discourse is skewed because so much attention goes to a handful of highly selective private colleges, which dominate coverage, or a few big research universities, or some others, you know, big football schools or whatever. All of these things matter. But I think there are two other aspects of higher education that matter much more and can be avenues for doing. And I'll illustrate them with two, the stories of two cities. One of them is the city of Dayton, Ohio, which in Inland Empire terms, we can think of as sort of the San Bernardino counterpart of that, that part of Ohio, a place with a long industrial and manufacturing heritage that has a lot of hard times recently. The source of Dayton's hope and renewal right now is a joint effort from Sinclair Community College, the oldest community college in the United States, which has invested heavily in training people in that area for the jobs this era brings, and the University of Dayton, a private Catholic school that has long been separate from the community, but has decided to move its headquarters and its research branches right downtown. Those two institutions together with different paths are saying Dayton's future is our future. Another illustration is Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Any of you who have ever used a ball glass canning jar, the Ball Brothers Fortune was part of what Ball State University, a public university, was named for. The leadership of Ball State decided uh, six or ten years ago that the future of the university, even though it's a public university, re rested on the future of their community. Would Muncie be a place where people wanted to come, where they wanted to raise their children, where the schools were good, and the schools were not good? So starting about three years ago, Ball State University did for the first time in the United States. It is a public university that has taken over running the public schools in that town. There was extensive community engagement. There were all sorts of, of, of action. This has received no mention in the national press at all. I ex except I believe I wrote an article about it you know, on the Atlantic site, but otherwise it's gone, gone undetected. The point for both of these institutions, community colleges, which as their franchise have has been developing the community, and universities that decide their future is in the community, even though that is not their name. The University of Dayton, a private place in, uh, in, in Dayton, uh, Ball State and Muncie believing that their future was tied to the community. I believe these are the points of leverage for higher education in, in the future of saying that community colleges, which provide the opportunities for this time and are of the community, and institutions of other sorts that may not dominate the national news but are private 
or public like Ball State, but realize that the welfare of their specific town and the region is part of their own future. Um, I found that so inspiring in the speeches, the speech is we heard this morning from the president and many others about how the future of this institution is tied to the future of this town and its surroundings. You know, the Inland Empire and Southern California and people of different backgrounds who might not always have been part of the University of Redlands uh, community. So if I were to come back where we started, uh, that, that the challenge is to understand what's happening and do something about it. I think everybody associated with the University of Redlands can feel after today's events that there is a very clear understanding of the reality here and what the potential is for this university, this community, and this region. Now the challenge for all of you, all of us, is to do it. Thank you. <laughs>
During that same age, I was the only black guy in Delta Chi to pledge as well, okay, which is weird at that moment, but you understand why later. By the age of 20, I was uh, starting my career in the entertainment business as a talent escort for the 40th Annual Grammy Awards. And 16 years later, I am the assistant manager of Creative Sync Licensing for Sony Music Publishing. And just last week, I received an email that I had been recommended to be a member for the Grammy Recording Academy. So it's full circle for me, which feels really good. Thank you. Appreciate that. But this path of success was not easy. You know, it took discipline. It took drive. It took damage control. It took intricate strategies. And it definitely took my faith in God. Um, by the age of 21, I was filling my undergrad classes. I was battling traumatic past of being molested as a child, which led to a substance abuse issue. I was disappointing my peers. I was disappointing the people I looked up to. I was disappointing myself, so that guilt set in my heart. And so these four strategies helped me get over these obstacles, helped me rebuild my career, helped me rebuild my reputation as well. The number one strategy is uh, finding your purpose, okay? And finding your purpose, um, we find that in, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Let me go back, my bad, here we go. <laughs> Of course, of course, this happens, right? Okay. Uh, well, finding your purpose uh, is important, and according to Anthony Mizaki, which is a branding expert, he finds that building your brand should be connected with clear goals, and you should be focusing on what you want to be as you build your brand. Okay. Finding your purpose is like finding the niche to your business, finding your product, finding your service, okay? It could be a skill that you're teaching somebody that may influence the public, like the Kardashians, right? Their influence led to makeup lines and other small, intricate things that you didn't think that would blow up, but they're influential, okay? When finding your purpose is important not to force yourself to find your purpose, and don't, don't feel too much pressure because you're not alone in conquering that difficult task. In finding your purpose, I also say that you should consider the five W's of who, what, where, when, and why. So when determining my purpose, my who was, who am I? I was a father, I was a entertainment professional, I was a first generation college graduate as well. When determining that second W of what, I was, what companies do I want to work for? I wanted to work for a record label. I wanted to be associated with the Grammy Recording Academy, okay? And even if you're an entrepreneur, that what question could be like, what products would I sell? And so that leads into the where. Where will I sell these products, okay? And where will I be in five years, professionally and personally? And that leads to the when of, you know, if you're a student, when is it good to get an internship? Or you want to be an author? When is it good for me to write my book? When is it good for me to start my PR and marketing campaign for that book, okay? And that last W of why is can be a simple question as in why am I passionate in engineering? Or why am I passionate in entertainment business? Or why am I not writing my goals down like my peers are? You know, something as simple as that, okay? When finding my purpose, it came, you know, when finding your purpose, excuse me, will come with ease when you truly desire the feeling of achievement, and my son, Mikey, was that desire for me. Okay, at 23, I had my son, Mikey Jr. At 24, I was divorced, and I became a single father. And I knew that my purpose was bigger than just posting a whole bunch of pictures of me and celebrities. It was making sure I was a good influence for that little boy, making sure I could provide, making sure that I wasn't solely depending on my mother to be a grandmother and a mother, okay? The number two strategy in personal branding and marketing yourself is being knowledgeable of the new new. And when I speak of the new new, I'm speaking, I'm referring to the new technologies, the new leaders, the new prof professions within your field, current events, the market share within a particular company that you want to work for. Knowing the new new will always be important because it will determine if you really want to take on that career path. And even if you're an entrepreneur, it's important to know the new new because it will help you determine whether you should spend a certain amount of money on a marketing campaign or if you should even invest your time in it at all, okay? Um, not knowing the new new, not taking that time to read articles is like going into a job interview and saying, you know what, I really want this job, but I know nothing about the company at all. I know nothing about the products at all, okay? 
And when you know the new new, you have to show that you know the new new as well. So share articles that are pertaining to your field on LinkedIn. Share it with your peers. Share it with your colleagues. When I worked for Motion Picture Licensing Corporation prior to being with Sony, when the Fox and Disney merger happened, though it was really none of my concern in terms of that merger, I showed my VP that I knew about that merger, and I sent that article to all my colleagues. And it showed him, oh, okay, this is another aspect of Mike Barker here. Maybe we should consider him to do this, or whatever it may be, right? But I left the company. No, <laughs> you know, not their fault, lying. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, in addition to showing that you know the new new, it's important that you engage with professionals within your industry as well, okay? And when I say engage with professionals in your industry, for instance, when I was an intern for Universal Music Group, I wanted to be a publicist. And I said, well, let me find the head publicist here at Universal Music Group and let me pick her brain on exactly what it's like to be in PR. And the fact that I picked her brain helped me realize that, oh, I don't want to be a publicist because they don't make a lot of money. I should go to the University of Redlands and get my MBA in marketing so I can be a director of marketing, right? <laughs> go Bulldogs. <laughs> All right. In addition to, um, I'm sorry, yeah. That leads me to the number three strategy of staying relevant within your industry for a significant amount of time. When you're relevant within your industry for a significant amount of time, excuse me, you are really showing stability within your industry as well. And a hiring manager will be more inclined to bring you on, right? But in my book, I had a Q&A with brand marketer, I'm sorry, brand expert, Philip Vandehusen, who states that it's not uncommon for young professionals to job hop. And that's because they're wise enough now to job hop to more money to higher positions. They're not gonna stay within a company and just hope that they're going to fall into this higher position. They're going for it now. So though it may sound a little contradiction, you know, staying relevant can be hopping around, staying relevant can be staying within a company, but you really have to determine that when it really comes down to your purpose and where you wanna be, right? If you don't know exactly if, how to stay relevant, I recommend that, you know, or not even stay relevant, but maybe to ask, take your career to that next step it would be to, one, polish your interviewing skills. And these same aspects apply to if you're a student, right? If you're going to all these interviews and you're not locking the position, it's time that you polish your interview skills. It's time that you take all those questions that were asked in that first interview, you should be writing those down and practicing them for that second interview. And you should be looking at yourself in the mirror and practicing them and working on your smile and working on your presentation and have your friends sit like an interview panel and have them ask you those same questions. Excuse me. Um, it's also important to maybe even consider a SWOT analysis as well. So do a SWOT analysis of yourself, of your brand, find out what your strengths are, your weaknesses are, your opportunities, and your threats, okay? The number four strategy in personal branding and marketing yourself is growing relationships. Throughout my 16-year career, I've always been told, network, get people's phone numbers, get email addresses. Excuse me, there's number four right there. Get email addresses, right? But by show of hands, how many people in this room have gotten email addresses and phone numbers of people they looked up to but never called them? Raise your hand. Right, I've been that same guy, okay? And is it because what, are you afraid of the awkward conversation? You don't know how to start the conversation, you know? And that was always an obstacle for me as well. But I overcame that obstacle by really having authentic conversations. By going to someone and saying, hey, I'm hella nervous in talking to you right now because I'm very inspired by you. And that right there will break down that barrier. But at the same time, finding those mentors as well that teach you how to have those authentic, authentic conversations too. Because that comes with professional maturity, you know? So I had my two mentors, Don Kelsey, professor at Kelsey Long Beach in Communication, and Barry Crutchett, who is the CEO of Crutchett Entertainment. And so I knew at some point that I had to talk to Don because Don had a PR background and I wanted to be a publicist. And I sat in class one day and I wrote myself down a script, our key points of what I'm gonna to say to her when I walk up to her. So you're prepared. Rehearse those, rehearse those questions, it's not weird. It may be a little excessive, but you're overprepared, and that's okay. And so I walk up to Don, and I say, hey, Don, I'm Mike Barker. I know you have a PR background. I just want to schedule some time with you to discuss PR. Okay, and I did the same thing. And now that, that picking brain conversation led to a mentorship, which led to now we're taking our kids to see the fireworks on the 4th of July. Same thing with Barry Crutchett, okay? I want to end my TED Talk with these three points here. Um, that I think are very important. 
Uh, not TED Talk, Red Talk, excuse me. Let me get that right, okay? Go Bulldogs, okay? Uh, <laughs> it's the last car right here. Look at me, I'm somewhat organized, okay? Here, I think these three questions that you should ask yourself to help you develop your brand. One, how closely are you living your life, both personally and professionally, aligned to your values? What are the goals that you're working towards, and how do your values play into them? This last question is, what different choice could you have made in your life to help you live at a greater alignment with your values? Ask yourself those three questions, figure out what your emoji represents you, and go Bulldogs. I appreciate you. I'm Mike Barker. Next up is Elsa Luna, class of 2004. She is the COO and CFO at KPCC Southern California Public Radio. She co-led a strategic and business planning process to take them from a granting organization to an early education quality delivery leader, in addition to launching a successful fee-for-service arm for training and consulting services. She received the 2015 CFO of the Year Award from the Los Angeles Business Journal, and she received her MBA from the University of Redlands and a bachelor's degree from UCLA. Her Red Talk is called My Story, First But Not Primera. Please welcome Elsa Luna. Hi, everyone. Buenos dias. Um, first, I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you to President Newkirk and the university for inviting me today on Inauguration Day. Very excited and hope that you find my story weaved into the makeup of what makes University of Redlands a leading institution, especially with its new leadership. I wanted to talk today about my story. And more importantly, can you hear me? More importantly, first or only. My story of being a first generation Latina is birthed by my ancestors and pioneers that brought for my family the opportunity to prosper in this wonderful country. My hope is that you can take a bit of my story and know that I'm not primera. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I identify as an Angelina, born in Los Angeles from two immigrant parents. My parents are from the state of Oaxaca, Mexico, a southern state where they grew up in two small pueblos, Yatzachil Bajo and Amatlan. To this, to this day, they talk about their towns with abundant fruit trees, kids running around, women making tortillas, and men tending to their fields. My parents identify as indigenous from the Zapotec Indians, known as the cloud people. The belief is that they descended from new, nat, supernatural beings who lived amongst the clouds, and upon death, were to turn back to the clouds. The Zapotec people created a writing system thought to be one of the first of Mesoamerica, a predecessor of those developed by the Maya, Mistec, and Aztec civilizations. Growing up, I learned that my family's rich culture while tasting spices and foods that to this day make my mouth water. Mole, tamales, chocolate, pan de yema. If you haven't tried Oaxacanian cuisine, you haven't tried good food. My parents today speak both Spanish and English, and my dad also speaks a dialect called Zapoteco, a remnant from his ancestors. Growing up until the age of five, I only spoke Spanish, living in Los Angeles. I learned English once I started kindergarten. So one can say I'm an indigenous Mexican-American native to Los Angeles with English as my second language. I consider my upbringing a part of a cross-cultural world that is deeply embedded in the roots of who I am. Growing up in one of, the most, one of the most distinct memories that I have was the work ethic my parents demonstrated. My mom cleaned houses, and my dad, who graduated with a degree in engineering in Mexico, worked as a school district technician until he retired. One of my most impressionable memories growing up was watching my parents work long hours, then coming home every night and studying English or going to night school. Here's a quick story. I call it my cutting board story. Every night, my dad would pull out between the sofas and lay his books on something 
that was a cutting board, a wooden cutting board. The edges of the cutting board were dark from the ebonizing hand oils that he would use every day. Growing up, this was what a desk was to me. I would wish and dream that one day, having my own cutting board would be worthy of my studying. When I was about 10, my dad drove me to the hardware store and bought me my own cutting board. I was super excited. I knew I'd have, I'd have arrived. I used that cutting board every night for countless evenings studying along my dad, and to this day, still have it at home. It got me through high school. It got me through college. And every time I, I see a cutting board when I pull out in the kitchen, I think about all the hard work and all the endless lives that my parents and I work so hard to be all that we can be. My dad always told me, having a high work ethic and making smart decisions was key to a successful life and a future career. My parents didn't learn English until I was about a teenager. When I was about seven, eight, and nine years old, I was the family spokesperson and communicator. I translated for everyone. Sometimes I, was, I belonged in family discussions that a child shouldn't even belong into. I think it matured me a little sooner than I probably would have been matured, but it gave me a big self-worth. It made me think that the English language and communication were super important. So growing up, I dreamt that I would want to share, communicate, and who, talk to whomever would listen to me, because that's what I thought was super important. I remember watching Maria Elena Salinas broadcasting in Unitusiero Univision, the Spanish nightly news. And I remember thinking, wow, maybe one day I'll be like her. So I attended her same alma mater, UCLA. I graduated with a degree in political science and international relations in the 1990s. During their, this time, there was a state ballot that some of you might remember called Proposition 187. It was to establish a state-run citizenship screening system to prohibit undocumented immigrants from using non-emergency health care, public education, and other services in the state of California. This initi initiative directly affected my classmates and their families. My activism and social responsible light sparked for me that year. Along with my fellow classmates, we marched and protested all around the city to repel this law and let everyone know, no matter your documentation status, you should be afforded the same rights and liberties, education, health care, and basic human services. This activism still lives with me today. We should all be treated with kindness, respect, and basic human dignity. This is a deeply rooted belief that has engined my social responsibility and introduces me to the world of nonprofit. But first, a side story, my first job out of college. It was for the for-profit world. I was a finance director. At 22 years old, I managed a team of 12 in finance, payroll, and operations dispatch, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was a little above my head at that time. But the thing was, for this company, there was only one thing that was important, which was the bottom line, profitability. It was key to all they accomplished, and when the return was not as expected, People and products were the first to be expended. That was my first lesson in the corporate world. At the time, a young Latina manager, freshly out of school, I was affected by something known today, and I didn't know it back then, called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, and accomplishments, and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed to as a fraud. Despite external evidence of their competence, those experiencing this phenomenon remain convinced that they are frauds, and they don't deserve anything that they've achieved. Individuals with this affliction incorrectly attribute their success to luck. I sure did. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, an estimated 70% of people experience imposter syndrome sometime in their lives. Has anyone else? experience this? Thank you. I'm not alone. I was so unhappy with work, and the other side of it, I was unhappy with what was happening in my mind. There had to be a working world out there that creating profit would be done in conjunction to helping people, places, and things. 
A mentor of mine introduced me to the world of nonprofit and first explained to me what a double line return was, one for profit and one for social good. Upon hearing this, I think I had solved my external problem. I needed to get into the nonprofit world. Now it was time to fix my internal problem. Who I was at this point and who I still am. I'm a woman, first and foremost, a Mexican American, at the time a new mother, a new wife, a college graduate, a new career manager, striving to learn about my society, all while having deep issues of self-anxiety, fear, and doubt. My next step was enrolling in a graduate MBA program at the University of Redlands. I felt that learning business, finance, and leadership would ground me and continue to enrich the real-world experience I was surrounded by. This was life-changing. My cohort of working adults shared their daily struggles, and we learned from our experiences. I graduated in 2004 with a master's degree in one hand and my baby girl on the other hand. I spent the last 22 years in the nonprofit sector focusing on my efforts in organizations that are about social good, environmental good, educational good, and now news and information to all. Today, I'm the Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer of Southern California Public Radio, the NPR station known as 89.3 and 89.1 KUOR, owned by the University of Redlands. And we also have a website called las.com. We're an organization dedicated to strengthen the civic and cultural bonds that unite Southern California's diverse community by providing the highest quality news and information across multiple platforms. We are a public forum that engages its audience in an outgoing dialogue and exploration of issues, events, cultures, and in the region and in the world. We seek to provide greater understanding and new perspectives to the people of these communities and their leaders. Every day, my job is to ensure that our operations run a double line return. If I was told this years ago, I wouldn't have believed it, but here I am. I wake up every day thankful that I can contribute to the fabric of what makes Southern California so special by promoting people who look like me. My experience, education, and now age have eliminated that self-doubt that I carried long ago. My roots in education embody my nonprofit work while stranging strong as a Mexican-American woman. I've been described in many ways in my career. A boss lady, a bulldog, and three that are very special to me. A doer, a dreamer, and a trailblazer. Truly a U of R alumni. Thank you for letting me share my story, and I truly hope you got a glimpse of what a first-generation experience is like in a community that has so many firsts, but not primera. Thank you. Next up, Dr. Patrick Lillard, class of 1962. He's an addiction psychiatrist based in Evans, Georgia. He earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Redlands, majoring in chemistry, biology, and history. He earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati and has worked in various neurology and psychiatry specialties throughout his career. His military appointments with the United States Air Force includes Brooks Air Force Base in Texas, the Stewart Air Force Base in New York, and the Clark Air Base in the Philippines. His red talk is called Stress is Inevitable, the Struggle is Optional. Please welcome another fellow Bulldog, Dr. Patrick Lillard. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to share with you life-changing lessons from my 64-year odyssey that began in 1958 at the University of Redlands. It is my belief these simple lessons were built on the foundation of my liberal arts education here at Redlands. The foundation is an open mind with humanitarian values, critical thinking, love for diversity, and a belief in unlimited possibilities. I also learned to appreciate how 
simple events stick with me over decades and become the seed of transformation. So, travel with me, if you will, for a little bit. You're walking down a jungle trail at night. It's totally dark and very wet. It's raining. You slip and you fall. Rolling down a steep slope, you fall off a ridge into quicksand. What do you do? Well, it's not a trick question. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. Don't struggle. It will suck you down if you do. Here's my story. In the spring of 1965, all my classmates in medical school, we learned that we were all going in the military. Um, no doubt, no option. I chose the Air Force. Subsequently, I went to the Air School of Aerospace Medicine to become a flight surgeon. Three years later, in 1968, I attended the Air Force Jungle Survival School in Luzon in the Philippines. If you were a flyer on the way to Vietnam, you needed this instruction in case you got shot down. As a flight surgeon, I qualified. Among the practical things we learned about the jungle survival was that snakes are your friends. They taste like chicken. (laughs) They did. The battle-scarred master sergeant told us, in graphic terms I cannot share in this uh, public company, polite company, if you fall into quicksand, don't struggle. It will suck you down. It was one of those simple messages that became embedded with me like a shadow dancing on the wall behind me. Don't struggle. My military experience, particularly my trips into Vietnam, were pivotal in my career as a physician and subsequently my understanding of human behavior. As a physician in Southeast Asia, I came very close with soldiers and Marines and airmen And I also learned about stress. One soldier had shrapnel wounds to the back of his head and brain and multiple shrapnel wounds in his arms, his legs, and his torso. I helped with that surgery. And in the rounds every day after that, when we go around to see him, he'd always, and I forgot to tell you, he was also blind. He'd sit up in bed and salute the surgeon, the neurosurgeon, who was introduced to him as a colonel. Um, If we asked how he was doing, he'd say, no complaints, sir. He was quintessential Marine. He embodied and epitomized the way our service members dealt with stress. Embrace the suck. Fifty years later, now I'm no longer doing neurosurgery. I'm a neuropsychiatrist with a special interest in stress, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. And I spend most of my time trying to help veterans find ways to make their struggles optional. The lessons are as follows. First lesson, all of us, for all of us, life is difficult and stress is inevitable. Yet we make this lesson more complicated by not accepting that fact. Does that mean we are obligated, duty-bound to struggle with everything? No. In fact, we do have choices, alternatives and options. And indeed, we have wonderful moments. The birth of our children, for example. For someone like me, the birth of our grandchildren. Just maybe great-grandchildren. Imagining such events fills us with hope and possibilities for the future. However, reality is not so gentle and generous. Everyone you have ever loved and everyone who has ever loved you, you're going to lose them or they're going to lose you. Struggle as we all do with this reality. We still search for purpose and meaning in our lives. Yes, some things are worth the struggle. I will give my life for my family. 
Maya Angelou said eloquently, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide to not be reduced by them. Is there a simple formula to avoid all struggle? No. But I want to share with you two things that can make the struggle optional. Very simple, but seemingly very hard. The first thing to liberate the struggle is the critical phenomenon of relationships. Nadine Gordimer said that the answer to the existential dilemma, that is, the thing that brings meaning and purpose to our lives is relationships. All varieties of relationships with God, with romantic relationships, family, friends, and all variety of creatures. Vivek Murthy, the past and present Surgeon General, said this, it is in our relationships with one another that we can find healing and a better path forward. The second thing to liberate the struggle can be found in the most powerful word in the English language other than love. The word is help. How can I help you? Can you help me? If you see someone struggling, it is very powerful to ask, how can I help you? In the asking, believe me, you might save a life. Why are we so reluctant to ask for help? Aren't we all, all of us, vulnerable in some way? Dr. Murthy says, help and be helped. Service is a form of human connection that reminds us of our value and purpose in life. Giving and receiving both strengthen our social bonds and make us stronger. Help and be helped. That makes the stress optional and the struggle optional as well. It's hard, but you can save a life by asking and giving. Let me finish with the story of Noah. He is a 36-year-old veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. I've seen him at least once a week for 10 years. He is from New Hampshire, was a tough young guy, played both ways in football, uh, fullback and linebacker, six feet two, 220 pounds, tough as nails, college scholarship for football. He was all out there all the time. He embraced the suck, but he was injured in college, and so he dropped out and he entered the army just like his father and his grandfather. He was smart and a quick learner, and after infantry school, he was placed in a program to be a combat flight medic. 16 weeks of class, and then his name became Doc. As he was called by his buddies, he was expected to save them when the blood flowed, or if he did not get there in time, he picked up the body parts of the soldiers he may have bunked with the previous night. In Iraq and Afghanistan, he was expected to jump off helicopters, sometimes under fire, with 90 pounds of equipment on his back, run, run to save his buddies, and sometimes to fight. Embrace the suck, right? A soldier took an RPG to the groin and abdomen, and Noah got to him in the mountains of Afghanistan. It was dark and hot with enemy fire. The soldier had taken uh, this injury to his abdomen and Noah picked him up and ran with him several hundred yards to the helicopter. The soldier kept looking at Noah as he tried to start the IV and stop the bleeding, but soon the soldier was no longer able to see Noah. The soldier was gone. To this day, Noah cannot get the face of that soldier out of his mind. It has been 13 years. He struggles with the memory every day. He is angry with himself. He's virtually paralyzed with the inability to make decisions. He's totally isolated. He has PTSD. 
a disease that kills the imagination. Please understand, he had only four months of training as a medic. I've been a physician for 55 years, have been on trauma services. I'm a surgeon. And I could not erase the memory of that event from Noah's mind. And I could not have saved that soldier. For him and for us, life is filled with triggers and reminders. He cannot escape the stress of his own mortality. Yes, yes, it is possible the stress may somehow make us stronger. I believe in that for a while. But does that, does that mean, not mean to be fulfilled we must struggle with everything? Indeed, there are things we can do to make the struggle optional. Connect. Love and be present for each other. And help others and be helped. You may save a life and the life you save may be yours. With my help, actually my insistence, Noah got a service dog named Angie. Noah and Angie bring meaning and purpose to each other's lives. Making connections. Noah is coaching basketball for girls 8 to 10 years old. He is learning that the struggle, even for him, is optional. The shadow dancing on the back of Noah's mind is fading, slowly subdued by the light of relationships and the fulfillment he gains by accepting help and helping others. If I have anything to say about it, by God, Noah will not be part of the tragic fact that 20 veterans commit suicide every day in our country. The stress is inevitable. The struggle is optional. Thank you for your listening. Next up is Dr. Sean McHenry Acosta, class of 2007 and 2009. He currently serves as core adjunct professor of global business and leadership at the, Uni at the University of Redlands School of Business and Society. He shares his multi-industry experience in public and private sectors with our community and those that he mentors. His current research explores the intersection of identity and leadership, and he'll be joined by Senior Associate Director of Enrollment Management Pamela Allen Coleman, class of 2016, for her MBA, and 2020 for her Master's in Organizational Leadership. She has served in various roles within the School of Business and Society over the past 10 years. As Senior Associate Director of Enrollment Management, she finds joy in helping non-traditional students reach their educational goals. Their Red Talk is called The Power of Representation. If they can see it, they can achieve it. Please welcome Sean McHenry Acosta and Pamela Allen Coleman. Hello, everyone. Oh, beautiful, beautiful people. Yeah, that's all right. You can say, yeah. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. 
We've had some wonderful speakers here. You know, we had young Mike, and the, you know, and then we had the doctor that was telling us that that power, very powerful story. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about the power of representation, and uh, our president touched on it very, very importantly. We were moved. We almost had to like change what we were doing, um, but uh, it's very important to us. Um, Pamela and I have a common identity, and that's kind of what sparked this conversation. So we're inviting you into our conversation, and sometimes we'll reach out to you like we are now. Um, we've all been through a lot. I was telling Pamela that this is the first time since March of 2020 that I've kind of almost been in a classroom again to see everyone. And I'm sure a lot of us have been through a lot with, with COVID, and, and it's been weighing in the back of our minds. And we're talking about a subject um, where we have an entire group of people that have that same weight that we felt for the two years throughout their entire life. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we are representing um, a newly formed organization for the university, the Black Student Faculty Administrators and Alumni Association. So we're representing them today, um, even though we do work for the School of Business. And uh, with that, we're gonna get started our conversation. All right. Well, you remember it was a couple of years ago when we started talking about this, and you know, I probably wouldn't have even thought about asking anyone else. And uh, I said, Pamela, you know, have you ever had a black boss? I was like, you know what? I've never in my entire life had a black boss. How weird is that? That's true. And um, until Sean asked me that question, I had never even thought about it. I'm so busy doing life um, that it never dawned on me. And I had examples of black leadership throughout my life. And I'll tell a story real quick um, about I'm my- I'm gonna move over here so that you're talking to me. Yeah, let's because, do that. Let's do that. Yeah, they wanna know, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know- Let's do it. Yeah. So um, my grandparents, um, I've come from the South, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, but a little suburb in the country. And my grandparents uh, were during a time when things were segregated, where black people didn't have much of anything. But during that time, my grandmother was able to get a full ride scholarship to a historically black university, where she graduated, uh, went on to become a teacher and owned several businesses. My grandfather only had an eighth grade education and he amassed wealth, he uh, owned land, he created a subdivision, he had a grocery store. So I just take it for granted that you can achieve anything you want to achieve, but when I got into corporate America and I started doing my life, it, it, I never had a black boss. I don't know if it was the industry or anything like that, but I never felt like I couldn't achieve because I had that example, just like our title. Yeah. If they see it, they can achieve it. So we need to be those examples. So. That's, that's true, you know, my, actually my great-grandfather um, was a baker, but he had all these kids. Um, he actually ran moonshine on the side in Kansas. <laughs> that's all right, the statute of limitations is, is over with that, so. Um, very different, and for, for us it was really exciting when, uh, when my aunt was able to move out of my grandparents' house um, and have her own apartment. And when my mom started working for IBM instead of Sears, uh, some of us are old enough to remember Sears. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they've been gone for a while. Um, and if you want to know why, you can attend one of our business courses, and we can kind of tell you that. <laughs> shameless plug. Uh, shameless plug. Um, but my mom worked for IBM, and she took me to work with her one night, and she ran the career exploration program in Los Angeles. And they had inner city schools, uh, high school kids come in. And she would teach them how to do a resume and business attire and things of that nature. And it wasn't until we started talking about this and getting ready for this pitch that it was a light bulb for me. And what am I doing? Like, you know, 50 years later, I'm, I'm here teaching, um, doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, that probably was really the only thing I saw from that perspective. Um, and. You know, it's, it's, it's really kind of odd that it took this for us to dig a little bit deep, or for us to have to be able to dig deep, um, rather than, oh yeah, there's this person and this person and this person mentored me, um, and careers change and people build their own lives. Um, they, they, 
they build their own business because they don't see this. They don't see a career career path. They don't have that mentorship. That's um, true. As a matter of fact, last year or two years ago, we did a, a seminar with B or a year ago, BSFSAA, of people that created their own paths. And, and nine times out of ten, it was because they didn't see it. That's if you can't get a seat at the table, you create your own table, and that's been my experience in my life. But I wanted the audience to reflect on this because it may be that you take it for granted. Maybe during your career, you just took it for granted that your boss identified with you, right? We don't ever think about it, right? But as I look in the audience, um, there's a lot of white faces, right? And so my bosses have been white males mostly, maybe because of industry. So we take that for granted. But is it only important to to us as black people that we have black bosses? No, it's important to all of us because when we have not only black but brown, gender different gender expressions, it makes for great conversations. But diversity of thought, you just get to bounce ideas. Like in my department. Um, it's, it's pretty diverse and lots of boss women. So I was talking to my, my boss lady, uh, my boss woman, <laughs> um, Nancy Spinson, and I didn't realize this where I'm thinking that because I'm black and I haven't had this, like, this kind of leadership, she mentioned to me that she'd never had a female boss. So it runs the gamut. We need to have diversity in leadership. And so I think it's super important, not just to us, but to you guys, to everyone, and especially for the university, for the things that the president wants to achieve, it's going to take all of us to really get outside our comfort zones um, and do that. So, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and um, that's true. It does. It takes getting outside of your comfort zone. Uh, you know, my... Uh, my grandmother went to college, but she didn't finish. My father went to college, he didn't finish. He told me one thing he learned, he learned what he needed to learn, and that was to have a thick skin. Um, and, and I totally get that. We have to have that. We go into boardrooms, and we're the only ones there. We go into meetings, we're the only ones there. Um, you know, we go to functions and we look over at the executive table and it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's all old white men. Um, and you know, we do need to have that diversity of thought. Um, you know, and so it, 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 you, you go ahead. You were going to say. I that. was going to say this because I told Sean that was his superpower. Sorry, superpower. <laughs> That's his superpower. <laughs> his thick skin. Um, there's lots of things that are unseen about Sean that make you know it's his superpower that he's able to navigate. And not only that, Sean, I wanted to call out this because we didn't talk about this, but you are a mentor. So what I was thinking about is. While we're thinking about what allies need to do, but we as black people or people of color also have a duty to, when we get in these positions, is to mentor and to be that example. I have found so much strength in the fact that our cabinet is so diverse. There's so many women on the cabinet. We have uh, Dr. Jones on the cabinet, Tamara Jostrin, Dean Martinez, to name a few, and I just feel like when we are in these positions, like I'm not a senior leader, but certainly I have a level of influence at the university having been here. So I feel like it's incumbent upon us to mentor. Mm -hmm. In fact, BSFSAA will be rolling out a mentorship program in the fall. And Sean doesn't know this yet, but he's been voluntold to lead it because he's a master mentor. He's a master mentor for the School of Business and Society. So just so you know, that's what we got on the docket for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Just like we were voluntold. No, I'm just kidding. We were voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, um, one of the things I think is really important and before we wrap up is, is it takes courage. And oddly enough, there's this thing inside of us, and the doctor was talking about it before, and I know we're running out of time. Okay. There's this thing inside of us that kind of holds us back sometimes. And I'm early Gen Xer, and she's later Gen Xer. She's almost millennial. I wanted to call her millennial. Um, yeah, I love millennials. Um, but there's this thing inside of us that, that we really need to click on. And it was really uncomfortable thinking about coming in front of a group of people and talking about this because of the time period I grew up in. Um, so it takes courage. It took courage for me to come up here and, and say what, what needed to be said. 
Um, for any of you who watch Legendary, we came, we said what needed to be said, we did what needed to be done. Um, <laughs> it takes courage to listen to things that are uncomfortable. It takes courage to show empathy and to really try to put yourself in each other's shoes. That's why I brought up the COVID thing. We all have been so uncomfortable these past two years. Um, and it's something that we can relate to. Anyone who's had to defend their dissertation knows how uncomfortable that can be. Um, but we have to have the courage. We have to, to be able to listen. We have to be able to listen and think about the other side. Um, and you know, when it comes to courage, my pragmatist partner here actually has some actionable ways that we can demonstrate that courage. So you know, before I wrap up and I let her talk about the list, um, I, I implore all of you to summon that courage within yourself. And, and the title says, if they see it, they can achieve it. And I'm going to tell you that if you can see it, we can achieve it. That is so true. And sometime when we, sometimes when we hear the word courage, it, means, it, it makes us kind of like intimidated. We're like, you know, I have to be bold. I have to be Martin Luther King Jr. No, you can be you. And do small things. When, you're, when you are in a room that we're not in, that's when you speak up. When you are sitting on a hiring committee, which we've all been on, and I'm on a few now, and there's a qualified candidate that doesn't look like you, and for some reason you're just like, oh, they're not a fit. Those are code words, right? Why are they not a fit? Why are you not comfortable? Lean in and say, no, they're qualified. They're going to bring something to the table that we don't all bring. We all kind of look alike and all we think alike. Let's bring this person in. So that's something that you can do as you sit at the University of Redlands. If you're not at the University of Redlands, even at your own place of employment or in your home and, and, and beyond, be a human first. Lead with empathy, which Sean touched on. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's one of the things, too. And just educate yourself. We are trying to solve problems that we did not create. So we're not to be tasked with always doing the heavy lifting. You can come to us about anything, but sometimes it just takes your own initiative, reading and learning and getting uncomfortable. That, that's really what it takes. So the university itself, we're becoming a more welcoming place. We've got some work to do, but first little steps, we became a Hispanic serving institution. That's, that's a welcoming. We got it to attract the talent pool, the diverse talent pool. We've got to make it a place where they want to be. Um, also, and this is a small thing for some, but it's huge. Juneteenth is now one of our holidays off, and so is MLK Day. That's huge. And, and, and so the reason I said that is because there's so much talent out there, and we've got to attract that talent. And when they arrive, make them feel welcome, and don't task them with everything diversity. <laughs> don't task them with that. So with that, we want to thank you. We'll be continuing this conversation, uh, hopefully quarterly, under the guise of BSFSAA when we have our ally meeting. And we would love for you guys to join us. We want to partner with you. And anything that you can think of that would help us all, we're open to that. And we want to thank you, President Newkirk, for really being a voice and listening to our group and really uplifting us. So with that, we want to thank you. And it's been a great thank day. You. <laughs>
Reaching a place of algorithmic fairness is important to me, increasingly important to me. As county coordinator, I'm responsible for building the capacity of educators and administrators for over 400,000 students. During distance learning, we saw great promise in the use of technology. My own children, who are sitting over there in the audience, were able to use technology to enhance their own learning experiences, and their, their teachers were able to give them such creative experiences in the classroom. Computer science education, however, was not so prevalent. Computer science involves computing and programming uh, their softwares, their hardwares, and also impacts on society. You might be thinking right now, what does computer science have to do with algorithms? Algorithms are step-by-step -step processes that we, that we use to tell our technologies what to do such as your smartphones, your Alexas, your technologically driven car. And guess what? If Netflix cho chose the show that you were going to watch yesterday or even last week, it's because the algorithms were doing its work. So, what's the problem with these algorithms? Well, these algorithms have a lot of biases. Take, for example, this image here. I did a search the other day for computer scientists, and I was shocked to see not a single person that looked like me. As a woman of color, I was expecting to see some people of color um, and you know, female computer scientists. I did see Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper, which got me really excited, but the computer scientists um, that I mostly saw in that initial search were white and they were male. Now, although they were extraordinary, during Black History Month, I would have thought that I would have also been able to see black computer scientists that have done some amazing work in the computing field. I would like to see these computer scientists even more. So I want to take a moment to honor these incredible computer scientists that have made a great impact in the world of computing. Dr. Clarence Ellis. He was the first African-American computer scientist that got a PhD in computer science. Incredible. Anna Easley, she contributed so much to the field of uh, rocket science. Mark Dean patented the first 1981 IBM PC. And of course, Katherine Johnson, she was literally the human computer. She is a world-famous mathematician, and I'm sure you have heard of her. So I just want to take a moment to pause and honor these amazing, incredible computer scientists. Thank you. And of course, there are so many more. Dr. Safia Noble, who works out of UCLA, is an incredible researcher that has done a lot of research around the area of algorithmic bias. She argues that algorithms are racist and continue to perpetuate societal issues. In 2016, she did a search for black and Asian girls, and what she saw was negative images associated with pornography. So I kept thinking, what about if these students uh, in our classroom did that same search and saw what, they, what, what she saw in 2016? Google since are doing a little bit better, but this is our reality. So it continues to be my role to impact computer science education from kindergarten all the way through to 12th grade so that they, they can be our computer scientists. They've got a chance to be our computer scientists of tomorrow. Not, not just any kind of computer science education, but the kind of computer science education that values identity, creativity, innovation, and more. Because we value these diverse perspectives that are going to be ingrained within our machines tomorrow. So, for a moment, I'm just going to turn it back to Netflix. If Netflix was going to continue to choose, uh, choose your shows for you and, and suggest those picks, I'm not saying that you're going to pick those picks all the time, but how does this affect and influence your view of the world? 2020 showed great promise in the use of technology to increase proficiency, uh, to, to increase productivity, efficiency, and more. Though we also saw great visibility in racism, sexism, all the isms that you can possibly imagine um, with permeating our technology. 
So we need to just kind of really be, be mindful of those algorithmic uh, algorithms and their bias. In the pre-algorithmic world, humans and organizations were responsible for decision-making around university admissions, recruitment, advertising, healthcare, education, and more, governed by legal systems and regulated by decision-making processes around fairness, equity, and transparency. Today, our machines unfortunately don't have the same sense of tra same transparency and accountability with very few legal systems. So the, these problems are real. There's so many implicit biases within these algorithms that are being created today. So I'm going to pause for a moment and talk to you about the Amazon robot. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the robot that was used for recruitment purposes. This ro robot was literally going through 10 years of historical data associated with the people that worked at Amazon previously in order to find the next and future Amazon engineers. The problem was the engineers were mostly white and male, and so in order to diversify the, the workforce of Amazon, it, there was very little chance because what those algorithms were doing were going through each of the resumes uh, in, built into a computing system and taking, uh, eliminating words such as women's colleges, women's groups, and so on. Amazon later retracted that robot. We are feeding our technologies with mounds and mounds of macro and micro data. They continue to do the thinking for us as we continue to feed it more and more data. So, I want you to take this example. One of my friend's sons was recently just on Google, and he came across an, a, a, an ad for a university, and he clicked on it, and he decided he wanted to go to it. He, he literally was like, I want to go to this university. The university was a for-profit university, where, and it wasn't even accredited. And I just kept thinking, what about if he had a different outcome, right? What about if he had so many different choices come up in those ads based on those algorithms that were doing its work? Would he have chosen a different university? I think it could even potentially be linked to his zip code, or, you know, there's just so many things that go into um, the, the data that the, the computing devices are picking up. So, you must think by now that I really hate the tech. Promise, quite the opposite. That's why I'm in technology. I see great promise in the use of technology. For example, there's so many, I, mean, I would love to see technology that is, and there probably is some technology out there that is able to identify learning styles of students so that before the teacher even identifies that, they're able to, um, you know, change their educational educational activities based on their learning styles. Wouldn't that be amazing? And also use that computing device to customize their learning experience. There are so many adaptable softwares out there right now. Google AI has a, an app that predicts floods before we even see them. Uh, pretty incredible. But this one's my favorite. My mother-in-law sitting over there, and she recently purchased a Rotimatic a roti is an Indian bread that Indian people eat almost every day. Well, I do anyway. So does my family, guaranteed. Um, she recently found out that she had, actually a few years ago, she found out she had arthritis, which prevented her from making the dough and making the roti. Um, and so she was very dependent on other people, including myself, which I don't mind making them, but you know, I know that she didn't like to ask all the time. And so my father-in-law, during on Valentine's Day this year, bought her a rotimatic all the way from New Zealand. It was shipped over all the way from New Zealand. A rotimatic lit, uh, makes makes those uh, rotis for you. It doesn't just make it though. It's a, it's called a, it literally identifies itself as a learning machine. So the learning machine is um, it, is basically picking up data based on uh, what we see as the most, you know, uh, the, the last question, such as uh, what kind of dough are you using, and did this roti uh, meet your satisfaction, and things like that, right? And so over time, this rotimatic machine promises to make the most perfect roti so that my father-in-law is just as impressed as he was when my mother-in-law was making that, that roti. And I shouldn't call them mother-in-law and father-in-law because they, they are literally my mom and dad. So I just want to point that out there. So, as you can see, 
technology offers you such great promise. So how do we reach a place of algorithmic fairness? We talked a lot about algorithmic bias, but how do we reach a place of algorithmic bias? First, we need to consider uh, having greater accountability, not even consider, we need greater accountability and transparency in our tech workforce and in tech organizations. We need legal systems in place that help us help, help these tech organizations create algorithms that are free from or have less, way less bias than there is now. We also need to raise greater awareness. Admittedly, that university story does also speak a little bit to uh, the lack of informational literacy, right, which is so important as well. But we need to raise greater awareness about algorithmic bias so that we're thinking about the data we are feeding our machines every single day, and we're thinking about the biases that are inherent within that, that data. We also want to diversify our tech workforce. That is so important, which is why one of the really big reasons why I do the work that I do today, right, to influence our K-12 students. So I leave you here today with this final thought. Our young people need to be technologically proficient. However, computing skills alone are not enough. We need to equip them with knowledge, skills, and ethical courage to, to design equitable tech that dismantles existing power dynamics, protects non-dominant groups, represents everyone, and most importantly, prioritizes the well-being of society. Doing this work with K-12 educators, administrators, curriculum developers, and anyone involved in shaping how future technologists learn has become increasingly important to me as I continue my doctoral research. I want to thank all the professors that I've had the pleasure of working with, including Dr. Howard, Dr. Knox, and Dr. Alvarado, who continue to be a strong source of support, as well as my family and my, doctor, my current doctoral cohort. I want to continue to influence the education of tomorrow, or even today, uh, so that we have, an we have more algorithmic fairness. Next up, Gavi Dariwal, class of 2022, is an international student from Mumbai, India, majoring in mathematics and computer science at the College of Arts and Sciences. He's passionate about mathematics and learning new concepts in it. By sharing his experiences, he hopes to encourage you to rethink your outlook on math. He says his college experience has had a profound impact on both his personality and his thinking. Being involved in a number of organizations on campus, he says, has helped him hone his leadership and social skills. His red talk is called Math, It Ain't That Bad. I'll be very interested to see why he thinks I should have gotten a better grade myself in school. Please welcome fellow Bulldog, Gavi Dariwal. I love mathematics. <laughs> Who agrees with me over here? Okay. How about I hate mathematics, I don't like mathematics, and I'm not a math person. A lot more. <laughs> I had that same opinion of mathematics in high school. All the classes that I took in high school, I used to think, think to myself, why am I learning these formulas? When am I ever going to use the quadratic equation? What job in the world would require me to know the derivative of cosine and sine, and all those cousins that they have in trigonometry? And why am I doing these problems when so computer software can do it for me in, in fractions of seconds? But those thoughts started to, started to disappear when I started taking math classes at Redlands. So far, I've taken 12 math classes at Redlands and three in my semester abroad in Budapest. And I'm here to tell you that math, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Frankel, a mathematician at UC Berkeley, uh, ha says this about why people don't really uh, get to engage with mathematics or they find it so uh, hard to d deal with. He says that the math that we learn in school is only a tiny, tiny part of, uh, of the entire realm of mathematics. Much of it was established a thousand years ago. The real treasures of mathematics have been kept hidden from us. 
If you took an art class in, uh, if you took an art class in school, and you were only taught how to paint a fence, you were never shown the works of Da Vinci or Picasso. Would that make you appreciate art? And that kind of makes sense what he's saying, right? If I just saw one scene in a, in a movie or, or, or a television series about an orchestra, and I say to myself, oh, it's so boring and I don't like orchestra, that would be wrong of me. And I think uh, some of my Gen Z friends in the audience can <laughs> nod to that. Uh, we have all had that preconceived notion of an orchestra. So if, if I've never been, been, been to a live orchestra performance, I've never experienced that, that grand experience, how can I have an opinion about something that's so widely appreciated globally? My first love encounter in mathematics was in Dr. Kuntz's multivariable calculus class. And uh, we were doing something with series, and it was with this equation. <laughs> I know you can laugh. It's it's a very, <laughs> it's a very scary equation. There are like Greek symbols in there. There's some infinity, and there's a couple of exclamation points. Of the, it's the formula shouting at you. What's what's happening? <laughs> so let me explain. This is what we call a series. A series is a sum of elements that is used to approximate certain irrational numbers. So for example, pi is, a, is an irrational number. And one of the many ways uh, we can use to approximate pi, one of, one of them is series. So in the project, we were dealing with three series, first was tan and was x. And this did a horrible job at approximating pi. It didn't even approximate pi to the first two digits. But then came Markin's formula. Markin's formula did a way better job. It approximated pi to the first seven digits using the first uh, six, uh, five, six terms. But then came this series. This blew me away. It was so powerful. The very first term approximated pi to the first seven digits. And the next term approximated pi to the uh, ne next eight digits. So the approximation grew by eight digits for every single consecutive term. And we, with my teammate, my, we checked our, rechecked our calculations, and it was really bizarre how powerful the series was. What was special about this is that this, this, the, series, the name of the series is Ramanujan series. It's named after the world's, one of the most world's brilliant mathematicians, Srinivas Ramanujan. And in, in the midst of learning about Greek, German, French mathematicians, this was the first time I got to learn something about an Indian mathematician, a native of my own country. And what was more cool was that he was doing some really groundbreaking work in England in the 1900s, early 1900s, in Trinity uh, Cambridge, Trinity College in Cambridge. And it was a time when the colonizers were still ruling over India, and he was doing all this groundbreaking work in their own backyard, which was really cool. Ramanujan series gave me that push to be more, more passionate about mathematics. Ever since that class, I've had so many instances where I've been wowed by the raw beauty of mathematics. And as you start taking classes beyond the usual calculus, you, uh, you get into more abstract concepts, and it may seem that you're getting away from the real world. So you take classes like abstract algebra, analysis, um, topology, number theory, and so one of, uh, one of the concepts that I really love in mathematics comes from complex analysis, and it's the Cauchy integral formula. Now, when I think of an integral, I usually connect it with physical quantities, like calculating area, density, volume, weight. But this was a bit different. It was you're calculating the integral of a function that's analytical on this contour that's on and inside the, it's analytical on and inside the contour, and you have pi in it and i in it, and it, it, was, it was really uh, shocking to me, but it was really beautiful as well. The proof was even more beautiful. The, in, in number theory, I was amazed by the Euler phi function and the Chinese remainder theorem, and all these concepts really tie in integers, prime numbers, and they help us solve uh, e equations in number theory. But to the non-math population out there, it might seem useless, like uh, there's no real motivation or f uh, fascination to even study these concepts in mathematics. But 
even even when you think that this is just just for the math brainiacs or just for the super intelligent people, math has a funny way of coming around. Remember series? We were just talking about series. They are extensively used in financial and business analysis by traders to make investment decisions. The Cauchy integral formula is crucial to uh, and really fundamental to complex analysis. And complex analysis is used in uh, signal processing, control theory, electronics. So the Wi-Fi, your speech recognition software, the chips in your laptops and phones, there's some complex analysis going on in there. And number theory, conce concepts like modular arithmetic, elliptic curves, they make the backbone of modern cryptography. Meaning every time you may make a purchase online or send a text message or send an email or use tap to pay on your credit card, they are encrypted and safe due to number theory. And we can all thank math modeling, statistics, probability to help us uh, make decisions through, during this pandemic. But in contrast to all those applications, I think professional mathematicians do their work and study mathematics for different reasons. Henri Poincaré, a famous French mathematician, mathematician once said, the mathematician does not, does not study pure mathematics because it's useful. They study it because they delight in it, and they delight in it because it's beautiful. And that's, that's sort of uh, bizarre, like he's talking about something, it looks like he's talking, some, talking about something that's really art, or like a concept in art. art. And one, uh, one example that really combines the application and the real, and real appreciation for mathematics was, well, I, uh, was seen like just a few weeks ago. We're all f f familiar with the game Wordle. It's really popular these days. A few weeks ago, Ma Grant Sanderson, a math YouTuber that, um, that is famous uh, for his channel 3 Blue one Brown, he used Wordle as an excuse to have an have a, have a insight into information theory, may have a chapter in information theory. So he used the concept of entropy, probability, to come up with the first best guess for the, for the Wordle game so that you can make the minimal amounts of uh, guesses to get to the uh, winning word. And it's really interesting. He used something that's fun as Wordle to make a, uh, make a lesson and understand some really interesting mathematics like information theory. I think the application savvy people out there can just find these uh, applications to abstract and abstract uh, theorems in mathematics. Terence Tao, one of, the, one of the foremost mathematicians in the world at UCLA, he once compared mathematics to a mountain range. You have a peak for number theory, you have a peak for geometry, algebra, topology, analysis. And this, they might seem in, in, um, like disconnected due to the mist that's covering them. And I think uh, the application savvy people are, are in, on that road. They don't really see how these uh, pieces are connected to the real world, but as they drive through, drive on, and get clear of the mist, they will really see how it's really uh, connected to the real world. For example, theorems in number three, they're, they're centuries old, 300, 300 400 year, year, 100, 100 years old. But the real applications in, in cryptography came just a few decades ago. When I was thinking of the title for this talk, I thought of the notions that people usually have with mathematics. It's hard, it's difficult, it gives you nightmares, <laughs> <laughs> and there's hate involved in it. I understand, I understand those, those feelings, but hate is a very strong word. It requires voluntary effort on your part to really dislike something. You remember Edward Frankel, our friend from pre uh, previously? He describes his first math mathematical breakthrough in college, something like this. For the first time in my life, I had something in my possession that no one ever had before. It was something, I could say something new about the universe, and he connected his emotion to the first kiss. It's really special. And he then knew that he would want to be a mathematician. And it's really interesting how he's connecting his own mathematical discovery to something as euphoric and special as a first kiss. So am I telling you to be really fascinated by Ramanujan series? Of course not. Am I telling you to absolutely love mathematics? Not exactly. 
Mathematics is used so widely around the globe, and for some people like Terence Tao, Henri Poincaré, Edward Frankel, it's more than an emotion. It's worth something, it's worth spending a life on. And when something is so widely applicable, it helps so billions of people around the world make decisions in life, and they don't even know it when they're using it. And for some people, it's more than an emotion, and it's worth spending a life on. I would ask all of you to think about mathematics and, and question it this way. Is it really that bad? <laughs> Thank you. In case you're just joining us, either here in the Glen Wallach's Theater or on the live stream, this is te uh, Red Talks at the University of Redlands on the special inauguration day of President Newkirk. Next up, Nor Norv Turner has served as a head coach and offensive coordinator in the NFL for nearly 30 years. He became the Dallas Cowboys offensive coordinator during their consecutive Super Bowl victories in Super Bowl 27 and 28. Turner compiled 118 wins during his head coaching tenure, raking him um, in the top 40 head coaches for wins in the history of the league. Before coaching in the NFL, Turner was an assistant coach at USC under John Robinson, winning one national championship and three Rose Bowls. He's credited for influencing several current and potential Hall of Fame players' careers, including Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, Drew Brees, and Philip Rivers. His Red Talk is called Leadership in All of Us. Please welcome Norv Turner. I like it. That's where Philip Rivers sat. He always sat right there, front to my right, so he didn't miss anything. That's nice. Uh, I haven't been a, in a front of the team in a while. This is uh, like a team meeting. It's kind of exciting. Uh, it's been a couple of years I retired. Uh, I don't miss having meetings with uh, masks or Zoom meetings. I like uh, it's been tough for those coaches and players and I think it's amazing what they've accomplished keeping the product at such a high level. Uh, I've enjoyed the, the last day. I've had a, a lot of different people come up and say hello and, you know, I, I recognize me. Hey, you're Norm Turner. You, you coach in Dallas. And then they like San Diego. And then uh, they say Washington. And then Minnesota. <laughs> and then Charlotte. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Uh, my wife didn't necessarily appreciate it that much because she, while I was going to work, she was doing all the moving and uh, getting the family situated and getting the new house and all that stuff. But uh, that's our that's been our life. We're 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 settled in Del Mar and we're home. Uh, I was asked to give a couple football stories and then talk a little bit about the approach we've had. Um, I think I'm going to start, uh, well, first of all, I guess I should, how did I get involved? I've, a number of people said, how do you end up here in Redlands? What's your connection? Well, I have two nieces that have gone to school here, uh, graduates. Uh, one niece is married to one of, one of her, a guy she met in school, who's the vice president here at Redlands. We have a another nephew who coached here in the early 2000s. And I think we have a couple of prospective guys, a uh, baseball player that might be coming in a while. Uh, so I think that's how I ended up here. But then I talked to President Newkirk last night, and she's such a football fan, and she started talking about all the football stuff and going to Nebraska and seeing games, and I know she's the reason I'm here because she went to here football. Uh, but we lost, uh, we lost a, an American icon in December. John Madden passed away. And uh, I, inter I, I met John Madden when I was about 25 years old. His best friend was my boss, John Robinson, his best friend growing up. I, we actually were on a recruiting trip and stopped at Coach Madden's house for dinner. And I'd grown up watching the Raiders and, and all that. So you're sitting there at dinner and Here's John Madden. You're sitting across from him. 
And uh, we, we saw a lot of them when I was coaching at USC, and then he went into broadcasting when I was with the Rams. He did a lot of our games, and, you know, I, he was great. I said hi all the time and all that, but I didn't have an interaction with him. And then when I went to Dallas and we became uh, a real good football team, he started doing a lot of our games. In fact, when uh, Troy Eggman eulogized them, he mentioned, he goes, I had the best deal in the world. John Madden broadcast my career between him and Pat Summerall. They did cowboy games, you know, game of the week. You all probably got tired of it, but they did a lot of uh, Troy's games and... Uh, you know, there was a close relationship, but I, as I was thinking about this, and, th and when Coach Madden passed away, I'm thinking, if people knew the, the experience, when the Madden Cruiser showed up to your facility, and the he would get there early, and all the players would come in, it was usually Fridays, and you'd get ready, you'd have a Friday practice, it's the last practice, it's not as intense as the other ones, getting ready for a Sunday Sunday game. But when the Madden Cruiser was there, the players were pulling the parking lot and they'd see it. And there was, a, there was an energy. It was crazy. And he would walk out to practice. And on Fridays, usually had an earlier practice, like 11 o'clock. And the players wanted to impress him because they wanted him to say good things about him on Sunday. So it was like a game. Or saying, okay, just back, you know, take it, off, take a little off it, back off a little bit. No, Michael Irvin is diving and catching balls, and Emmett's running down the sideline, and they, you know, they want John Madden to number one be impressed by them. They probably wanted to make the Madden team, and you know, they want him to say good things on Sunday. So then the procedure is, if if you're the head coach or the one of the coordinators. There's meetings set up, and you go and spend 15, 20 minutes with Coach Madden and Summerall and the rest of the crew, and they'd ask you about, you know, your game plan. They'd talk about the team you're playing, you know, getting background information so they could do a good job with the broadcast. Well, I knew John Madden knew as much football as I did and more or more. And I knew he had watched every film I had. He had a bus, and he probably did a game in New York the week before, and he, and he wouldn't fly, so he took the bus all the way to Dallas. And all he did was watch football tape and stop at bad diners. That's <laughs> what he did. And I knew he had seen every bit of tape that I had seen. So when you go in to talk to him, it's like, a final exam. You're going in to take a test because I'm, I want to know, I want him to know that I know what's going on in this game. And you'd sit down and he'd ask me about a player. Uh, what, what's Lawrence Taylor look like? Is he still playing good? And you'd say, well, he's, you know, he'd give an answer. He'd shake his head. Okay, what do you think? What do you think the key? What do you have to do here? And you'd go through it and it was absolutely, you knew he had seen all the film you had seen. So I just wanted to get the answers right. You know, I was more worried about what Coach Madden thought than I was about the game because I knew we were prepared for the game. So uh, it, was, it was quite an experience uh, with Coach Madden. Now, the other thing, my wife is famous. Nancy's over here somewhere, my wife. She's famous for these pies. She makes apple custard pie, and she used to make for It started with Brad Johnson our quarterback, he was in a little bit of a slump. She made him this pie, and he had a great game. So she kept making him. Well, Coach Madden got wind of this pie, and he said, I want to try it. So he grabbed a piece of it. So he would call on Thursday. He'd call me and say, hey, you know, I'm coming in for the game. This is when I was the head coach in Washington. And, you know, I, I hope we can spend a little extra time. I want to talk to you about some things. And Oh, by the way, is there any way, any chance Nancy could make me a pie? <laughs> and you all know, you've seen Coach Madden a million times, you know, uh, that pie was uh, a big, big thing and something he, he really liked. You know, he was, he was the best, and uh, I was lucky he, he selected me to be on a competition committee with him. They, up until he passed away, he was still working with the NFL 
and trying to help make the game better uh, and very, very involved. And you get calls from them. Have you watched? Have you seen this play? Have you seen this? Uh, and I was on the committee with him, and it was uh, really, really something special, uh, the relationship with him. And we all know how much he's meant to the, to the game, not only the game of football, but all the young kids and the, and the games and everything else. Uh, you know, when we get together and we talk about uh, putting a team together and then uh, the whole leadership thing, the whole performance thing, uh, I kind of had a, got to where we addressed it as a group. And, and peer pressure is great, and, and I think it, it brings out the best in, in all the guys. Uh, but when we present, the first thing I'd start talking about, hey, you know, as a, as a group, we have a common goal, okay? And we know what, what the goal is. We, the goal, we want to, you know, we want to win, but we're all in this thing together to do that, and that's a big part of it, to win. And then, uh, you know, we want to be the top offense, top defense, one of the top, top special teams. We want to be high, and we want to perform at a high level in those areas. And then the way I think you really get to the guys – is we, we have a system, we have a plan that's going to allow you to have individual success. Okay, and, and you want to win, you want to be have a productive and, and all that, but deep down, you know, these guys want to have individual success. And, and I was lucky in, in terms of the side of the ball, my expertise, where I majored, I guess, offensively, there's a track record where you could show if you do these things, okay, if you do these things, you will be successful. You're a receiver. And I could put on 12, 14, 15 guys who, who had had great success in the system we used. If you're a running back, I've, I've coached seven running, seven running backs that led the league in rushing, 20 guys that went over 1,000 yards. So if you're a running back, we went to, when I went to Carolina with Christian McCaffrey, we started showing them tapes of all these guys, have catalogs of tape of different guys doing the things that we're going to ask him to do, and they're not all the same, and the things that, he, that fit his style, we majored in. Uh, so that is something I think that really does motivate these guys, and they look and say, okay, we want to win. We want, you know, we want to have great production, but I can be successful with with this system. Um, talked about to be to be the best team we can be. Everyone in the room has to be accountable to each other. Okay, you have to answer the guy. You playing right guard, you have to be accountable to the right tackle. You have to be accountable to the center. You. You're in pass protection, you're a tackle. You have to be accountable to the quarterback. The quarterback has to do his job to help you do your job. Uh, and then, like, like you're accountable to each other, you have to understand uh, and respect that responsibility. Uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, it's not just, I'm going to go out and do my job. It's tying the entire thing together. Um, and if everyone does their job, you help each other get better. Uh, and the best players I've been around, uh, they help the people around them get better with their, with their performance and, and the way they go about doing things. So how do you get this done? We had a list of things I, that I really spent a lot of time with our guys individually and then collectively. Number one, you have to be coachable. Uh, and that, you know, sounds simple, but sometimes it's not. And you have to understand what we're asking you to do, and you have to, at the best of your ability, you have to go out and do it. Uh, a big one, because it's the NFL, and some people, they, they, don't, they don't appreciate this. Uh, I, was, I was talking to... Uh, Coach Good and, and we were laughing about it. These guys are 21, 22, 23 years old, and there's a lot going on in their lives. Uh, you have to be engaged, 
And it's harder for young guys to be engaged now than ever because there's so many other things that can be distraction uh, on a daily basis, uh, not counting when they leave the facility. Uh, but you, you have to find a way, and, and we, being engaged is a two-way deal. They have to be engaged, but we have to find a way to keep them engaged. And through the years, we've, cha we've changed the way we meet, uh, the, the amount of time we meet, uh, how much time we use walkthroughs, how much time uh, we simulate things for them. Uh, the one thing I learned, obviously, through the years and a long time ago, and, and continue to grow with it, all these guys learn differently. In the classrooms here, people learn differently. So we continue to try to find different ways to expose them to things that will stimulate and help them learn and help them be engaged. Half our meetings at, at different points are on the field walking through uh, to create that con concentration and that attention. Uh, Important for me with uh, dealing with uh, the pro athletes, and some of them look at me like I'm crazy when I say it, but don't be sensitive. We're going to coach you. Uh, we're going to be demanding. We're not going to be demeaning. And I would never let one of our coaches or a player be demeaning uh, in, 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 that in that manner. We're going to be demanding, but we certainly are not going to allow you to be demeaning. Uh, really, really important one, and this is, this is interesting. Don't get bored. Don't get bored. And it kind of, you may say, well, that's what you just said, and uh, be engaged. To me, it's totally different. Uh, getting bored is getting, thinking, okay, I've got this technique down. I'm going to move on to this. I can do this. Uh, my best, my best. Best example of it, when I first went to Dallas, and I hadn't been around Troy Aikman a lot, and we back there throwing, and we're teaching them the, the receivers how to run certain routes, teaching them where to throw the ball, how to throw it, when to throw it, all the things you go through. And I'd stand behind him, and we'd run a route, and like eight guys would run it. And he'd draw back and throw it and hit the guy in the numbers, hit numbers, numbers. And I'm thinking back... I go, it must be, to myself, I'm going, it must be boring to be that good. It must be boring just to be able to, you know, like a pro golfer that's down the middle every time. That must get boring. And then, after watching him several times, it's a little slow sometimes, it clicked. The reason he's so good, and the reason that ball's on the numbers every time, because he doesn't get bored. He doesn't get bored. He has, he has the same drop, same technique, uh, same release. It's, it's every time he does it, there's a purpose. He's throwing that football. He's performing that act with a purpose. And one of the problems you see with young guys, uh, I probably can uh, credit Patrick Mahomes with a lot of this, they're working on throwing the ball behind their back or see if they can throw a no-look pass and all that. That comes out of board, and that, sometimes that happens. Uh, but I, I really believe, and I talk about a quarterback position, but it could be, the, it could be your right tackle, it could be a safety, it could be a corner. A corner. Uh, don't get bored. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Except each guy expect, accept the responsibility you have. Uh, you're responsible to each other. Uh, competition, there's no question there's competition makes us better. Uh, we tried to, in everything we did in practice, create competitive situations uh, where you're going one-on-one, -on -one, you're going three-on-two, you're going seven-on-seven, seven, you're going 11-on-11, 11 11, uh, but to create as much competition as we could. And then the last thing I always put on there is be a pro. Uh, people say, well, what's it mean to be a pro? Well, we just listed what it means to be a pro. Uh, but that's an emphasis. Here's, here's what, if, you, if you're going to be successful uh, long-term uh, in the National Football League, that's, that's uh, 
uh, the way you need to go about doing things. And it's important, and this is, you know, down here is to be a leader. It's important, uh, we talk leadership, that the guys who get it and have been there set the example for the young guys. The guys that have been there set the example for the young guys. Uh, you know, every, everyone has leadership abilities. Uh, you all see the, the guy yelling on the sideline, uh, mic'd up. A lot of times those aren't the leaders. If you look behind, there's guys rolling their eyes, you know, because the guy gets mic'd up, he sees a television camera. He may not be a leader. Yelling is leadership. Uh, it can be, but most of the time it's not. Uh, best example of leader that very rarely, very rarely said anything was Darren Sproles. But he, he, set, he set a great, he led by example. Hardest working guy, maybe I've coached uh, about five, he said five eight. He's about five, five and a half, 190. Unbelievable player. Uh, that's actions speak louder than words with leadership. Actions speak louder than words. And it, it can be in a meeting room. It can be in, in a team meeting. It can be in a walkthrough. It can be in practice. Uh, but, but there's no question that that is critical for me. Actions, and I, you guys heard me say that a lot, actions uh, speak louder than words. And then... You know, a little bit along the lines, challenge each other to be better. Uh, and that's leadership. Challenge the guy next to you to be better. Challenge the guy on, uh, going against you to be better. Work together uh, to be better. Um, that's, uh, that's critical. And I don't know my time is out. Am I out? Okay, I just one thing. Keys to our success, keys to individual success. Okay, your attitude. You can control your attitude. You have the ability to control your attitude. Uh, your preparation. You can control your preparation. Okay, uh, you don't need someone helping you with that. You can control that. You obviously can control your effort. Uh, those things uh, create consistency. And one of the biggest things that we sold our players because you can't do it. Uh, you can't play the game if you don't if you're not great condition. Uh, that prepares prepares you to play. And then one of my best friends uh, in coaching, Pete Hainert, he started coaching in the NFL when I did in 1985. He just retired, but he always made he always made it, the players, and he always I, I had him always give the talk to the entire team to the offensive guys. Individually, take ownership of who you are and what you want to be. Because if you don't take ownership, you got no chance. And there's too many guys that have fallen by the wayside and they, well, I didn't get coached. Well, they put someone in front of me that wasn't as good as me. Take ownership of who you are, what you want to be, uh, and you have a great chance of being successful. All right? Thank you very much. I was not going to be the one to wrap up Norv Turner. <laughs> Next up, Peter Kaufman is the chairman and CEO of Glen Air Incorporated in Glendale, California. They're a manufacturer of electrical and fiber optic components and assemblies, primarily for aerospace applications. He first started working for Glen Air while in college nearly 40 years ago and has been a CEO for a very long time. He's a longtime director of Westco Financial, a unit of Berkshire Hathaway, and is a current director of Daily Journal Corporation. In 2005, he edited and published Poor Charlie's Almanac, a compilation of talks given by his longtime friend, Charlie Munger. Kaufman is actively involved in a variety of local and national nonprofit organizations. His red talk is called 12 Minutes on a Good Life. Please welcome Peter Kaufman. So I'm, I'm known for giving very unusual talks, 
I typically use props, and there's two reasons I do that. One is then I don't need any notes because the props remind me of what I intended to say. And the second is the audience tends to remember the things I said when they can remember me standing here, for example, holding this app. So I'm going to take on what I think is a very audacious task today. We together are going to attempt to define a good successful life and we're going to try and do it in less than 12 minutes. See, I have a clock over here. You can't see the clock, but I can see it and it's racing down. 12 minutes, okay? But we're going to get some help. In the world of statistics, statisticians say that a large relevant sample size is your best friend. Now, why do they say that? They say that because a properly drawn conclusion from a large relevant sample size almost cannot be wrong. Approaches the limit of zero in terms of the probability of it being wrong. Large enough sample size, relevant enough, draw a proper conclusion, can't be wrong. So let's attack relevancy first. We're going to try and find a sample size that's highly relevant to what? To a university. How about commencement addresses? What could be more relevant at a university than a commencement address? And is there a large sample size available of commencement addresses? Why, there's thousands done every year, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands have been done. As your servant, I have reviewed quite a few of these commencement addresses. And I have found that there are some very simple conclusions that can be drawn, and I think they approach a limit of zero in terms of their non-applicability. They're, they're correct. In fact, every commencement address that I looked at, from Steve Jobs to Mother Teresa, had the same five factors listed. So we're going to race through these because we only have nine and a half minutes now, okay? Some of them I'm going to tell a little story, others I'm just going to race through. The first one has to do with this apple. There's this beautiful Zen line that says, anyone can count the number of seeds in an apple. Few can count the number of apples in a seed, okay? So what's the first thing they always tell you in a commencement address? Have a big dream. Have a big goal. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Lead an additive sum life. Don't end your life with the same number of seeds that you started out with. End your life with a whole bunch of new apple trees. Show of hands, is there anybody in this room who's heard a commencement address that did not tell you to have a big dream? They all did, didn't they? All five of my things, you're going to find, they're in every commencement address. Because what is a commencement address? It's literally an attempt to define a successful good life, isn't it? Okay, so that's number one. Have a dream. Number two. I'm famous for this clicker. I have this story, and I don't know, it, I, I, I'd never heard this story before. And probably nobody in this room has ever heard this story before. It's one of the most remarkable stories that exist. So you'll remember me forever with this clicker in my hand. So you'll remember the story, you'll remember the point. Because number two, point number two is take a risk. Lean into discomfort. Go all in. Remember that. Go all in. Why is it so important to go all in in life? Because there's magic attached to being all in. Magic. There's an adult male professor named Daniel Kish who when he was two years old was diagnosed with cancer of the eyes and his eyes were removed. Can we all agree that Daniel Kish cannot see? And yet, if you punch in Daniel Kish, K-I-S-H, on your smartphone and click Google Images, you'll see a picture of an adult male safely riding a bicycle in traffic. Why? Well, you say, well, that's impossible. No, there he is. 
he's safely riding a bicycle in the traffic. So I have an article. I ran into this article. A reporter says, how in the world do you do this? You don't even have any eyes. He says, oh, it's very simple. I, I make this clicking sound with my tongue, and I hear the echolocation come back, like sonar. He goes, I'm Batman. You know, bats, bats are blind. He goes, I'm just like a bat. I make this clicking sound, and I can hear it come back. And the reporter goes, I can't, I can't, I can't believe that. And Daniel Kish says, let me remind you of something, my friend. I lost my eyes. Do you know what happens when you lose one of your primary senses? What do your other senses do? They go through the roof, don't they? They asked him, have you ever been able to teach anybody else how to do this? And he said, the only people I've ever had any success teaching this are other blind people. Because to learn how to do this, to be able to do this, you have to be all in. And there it is, the magic of being all in. Things are not the same. You're going to say to yourself, I can't do that. Are you sure? What if you were all in? What if your group was all in? And I'm cheating on this one because I couldn't find any fake celery online. So this is fake lettuce. But just pretend that this is a celery, okay? The third thing every commencement address is going to tell you is be kind. Everyone you meet is battling something. Be a good human being. It's all about relationships. And it is all about relationships. What's that got to do with celery? When you pursue fame, power, and wealth, you can eat those things all day long, and it's like eating celery. They're empty calories, and you get to the end of the day and you're still hungry. What are you hungry for? You're hungry for human touch, for attention, companionship, and love. That's what makes you human. It's not wealth, power, and fame that make you a human being. It's close connection with the important people in your life. The Turks have this beautiful proverb, no road is long with good company. That's how you want to live your life, surrounded with good company. So the number three on the list, be a good human being, be kind to others, is absolutely true. John Wooden quotes this, what he calls the wonderful mystical law of nature. That the three things that we crave most in life, happiness, freedom, and peace of mind, all come when we give them to somebody else. You can't get them on your own. Ben Franklin said, when you're good to others, you're best to yourself. He didn't say, when you're good to yourself, you're best to yourself. No, he said, when you're good to others, you're best to yourself. I'm going to race through this next one. This one's so simple, I got band-aids here. What are the band-aids for? If you fall down, get up. Every commencement address you're ever here, if you fall down, get up. If you fall down, get up again. If you fall again, get up again. Okay, this must be really good advice because everybody gives this when they define a successful life. Okay, what I think is the most important of the five, this is my main message of the day. If I only had three and a half minutes to give this talk instead of 12, this is what I would tell you. Okay, number five, clean up your own messes. Now this is a story I was at a benefit one night, and they were auctioning off dinner with Dr. Drew Pinsky. Show of hands, anybody here ever heard of Dr. Drew Pinsky? A few have, okay? He was a general practitioner in Pasadena, California, where I live. He was so good at helping human beings negotiate very difficult pro problems that they gave him a radio show. And then later on, they gave him a TV show, Celebrity Rehab. But let me tell you, this guy's not a flake. This guy's a really solid guy. So I bought dinner with him. I spent two hours listening to Dr. Drew Pinsky. And I want to share something with you. And if I go over a minute, I hope you give me one minute, okay? Because this is the most profound thing you may ever hear in your whole life. It really affected me. It's changed my whole approach to life when I heard this. He said, you know what? He said, I've done so many rehab programs that I've gotten to the point where I can tell with 100% certainty 
whether someone's in their last rehab cycle or whether they're going to come back again and again and again for who knows how long. I looked it up. There are some of these pop singers that have gone to rehab 24 times. He says it's very simple. We're having one of our group therapy sessions, and Peter gets up, decides he's going to get himself a soda. Peter gets his soda. He comes back. He sits down at the table. We finish our group therapy session. Peter gets up, and he leaves, and he leaves his soda can behind him. Peter's coming back for more cycles of rehab. Peter's work is not done. Peter is mentally ill. Or Peter gets up to get himself a soda. And he pauses as he gets up and he says, while I'm up, may I get anybody anything? And then he comes back. We sit down. We finish our group therapy session. And not only does Peter pick up his can and put it in the recycle, he cleans the whole table. Guess what? This is Peter's last cycle of rehab. Peter is now well. Because the definition of good mental health, and here it is, this is so profound, the definition of good mental health is being aware of the people around you, and in particular, being aware of the impact upon those people of your behavior. Is it neutral? Is it negative? Is it positive? And when you're aware of the people around you and your behavior is positive, you are mentally healthy. Now, the second I heard that, I said, you know, this is a self-diagnostic test that I can apply to myself, and no one ever needs to know the results of this test. And I didn't like the results of that test. Did I clean up after myself? No, I didn't. But I do now. The nice thing about this test is not only is it a di diagnostic tool, it's a prescriptive tool. If you ask yourself the question, do I clean up my own messes, and the answer is no, how do you solve for that? How do you get better mental health? Start cleaning up your own messes. All right, here's the punchline of my whole talk. When you become aware of the impact on the people around you, you start to clean up all kinds of messes, even the messes that you didn't cause. Okay? Now imagine if everybody in the world did that. What kind of a world would we have? We'd have a fabulous world, wouldn't we? We'd have a world in which everyone was leading a good, successful life. So let me wrap up here. I see my time's expired, but I got, I got an extra allowance. Dream big. Take a risk. Be all in. Be human. Get back up if you fall down and clean up your own messes. Thank you. Those of you that have been with us the whole time, I salute you. We have one more, yeah, there you go. Give yourselves a round of applause. We have one more panel, and it's, uh, it's our last Red Talk. And I also want to give a shout out to Jen and Kathy and Alyssa, all the people, Trevor, for making this possible. They've been doing a lot of work for this, so thank you. <laughs> Julia Schuler is the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders Clinic Director at the University of Redlands. She earned a bachelor's degree from the university and a master of science degree from the University of Washington. Her areas of interest include ped pedagogical considerations for clinical competency development, if I, only I could say that easier, 
Adult Neurogenic Disorders and Alternative Clinical Experiences. She'll be joined by Dr. Lisa LaSalle. Is it, she's a professor and chair of the Department of Communication Science and Disorders at Redlands. She and Julia have worked closely together for the past six years in providing quality graduate uh, education for U of R's Master's Speech Language Pathology, or SLP, program, and in leading the advising of undergraduate students interested in pursuing a career in SLP, audiology, or related fields. Dr. Renee Van Vechten holds the Fletcher Jones Endowed Chair in American Politics and Policy and teaches courses about U.S. institutions and policy. She's the author of California Politics of Primer, lead editor of Political Science Internships, and is co-author of the forthcoming book, The Politics and Policy of Food. Most importantly, she was my professor in Government 111, but that's another story. And last but not least, who doesn't love Tony Mueller? He is the founding director of the, university, uh, founding director of the U of R's Office of Community Service Learning, which began in 1991. He and his staff had, have administered the service learning graduation requirement for the past 30 years. The university has been the recipient of the White House's President's Award for Outstanding Service to Children, multiple honor roll awards from the Corporation for National and Community Service, and has received the Carnegie Foundation's first college classification in both service learning and community, and community engagement. Moderated by Jim Fallows, this Red Talk is called Local Problems, Local Solutions. Please welcome Julia, Lisa, Renee, Tony, and Jim. Thank you very much, um, Evan. Thanks to you all for being here. I think let's all give Evan a round of applause for what the job he has done today. It really is great to, to, to see him here. We have covered a lot of territory today, and I found it tremendously um, enriching. We had this morning's inauguration ceremony, which was so memorable and moving and represented all different parts of, of the university. This afternoon, we've talked about the game of football. We've talked about mathematics. We've talked about personal branding. We've talked about all sorts of things. And now we're going to come back in this final panel to where we started this afternoon, was essentially, which is local ways to have leverage about problems that have national and global implications, but where the point of access uh, may, may be local. And Evan has given you the, uh, the introduction to this wonderful panel we have. Here is the order of battle. I'm going to introduce each of our panelists to speak about the ways in which they have been diagnosing a problem that has local significance here in Redlands and the Inland Empire, and the ways they have dealt with it and the, the implications of that for, for larger, uh, larger solutions to these problems around the world. So we'll have those presentations one after the other in an order I will uh, tell you about. Then we'll have a little bit of discussion after that, and then we will hit our time mark. But I'm going to ask each of our panelists for a, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> There's plenty of time uh, that, that just to sort of sum up the main message you would like this crowd to bear in mind at the end of the programs on this, this eventful day. So um, let us start at the moment. Um, so, uh, Lisa, I think you are going to give us our first pr presentation. We heard that, you know, you and Julia have been so involved in the speech disorders uh, clinic. Tell us what we should know about your work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I want to just tell, us, tell you that we have both an undergraduate program um, of about 90 majors and a graduate program of 78 students right now. Um, it's a master's SLP program, so it's a graduate um, program. And many of you probably just want to know, how do we begin to tell you what, what an SLP does? Um, speech language pathologist. So, uh, we help people who have communication and swallowing disorders um, or needs, and we do so across the lifespan. So the influence of our field is vast. We all have a real passion for this field. Um, and when Julie and I were talking about what do we want to share, um, I was really remembering a quote by George Washington Carver, and it really has to do with passion and helping across the lifespan. So how far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. And so I really feel like that kind of sums up our lifespan part. Um, so what's our first local problem we want to address? Um, people need access to our SLP services, especially those that are no cost or low cost. 
And the solutions we provided to this problem is, please notice, um, right next door here, the activity that we generate Monday through Friday at our Truesdale Clinic. Um, we have uh, assessment and treatment services for individuals of all ages. We have a dedicated playground. Um, we have specialty clinic rooms. And we've offered many community-based programs over the years. Uh, currently, we have partnered with San Bernardino School, um, and that particular, it's the early literacy um, program, child development programs out of the San Bernardino City School District, Unified School District. That's an important one for us. We offer specialized services in other local school districts all around Southern California nationally. Um, and Julie, for example, runs a program that helps people with Parkinson's disease. So it's a Parkinson's disease treatment program at Plymouth Village Continuing Care Community. And for the past two years, like many other essential helping professionals, we have spent some time on Zoom offering health, uh, telehealth or telepractice services. The second local problem I just wanted to bring up is that there's not enough specially trained Spanish bilingual SLPs. Um, and a solution to this problem has been thanks to Dr. Barbara Comboy as a founder, along with Drs. Maria Munoz and Saul Cooperson, and we offer a Spanish bilingual certificate for our graduate students. Uh, University of Redlands is also now, as you've heard, a Hispanic-serving institution, so that means there's opportunities for grant writing, training grants in particular, and for attracting Latinx students um, and faculty, but also clients from the community. So. Julie, do you want to keep going with that? Yeah. Okay, there is a shortage of speech language pathologists in the local community and also nationally, which adds to the problem to this is that these graduate students need to be trained and educated. So a solution has been that our graduate program has increased its enrollment, which will help the workforce locally and nationally in the future. But there is a bit of a challenge in that we need to prepare and train these students using speech language pathologists. So some solutions to this has been our community-based programs that Lisa mentioned. We're very thankful to the local community for allowing us to, to bring our students to them and, and so that our students are in those programs serving also children and adults and giving them access to services while they're being trained. We have an alumni and community member network that has helped us in supporting our training. These are speech language pathologists who uh, accept our students and train them at their work site. So that network, is uh, their help is invaluable. For the future, we look towards being creative locally and nationally. And some ideas that we think about are access to medical or hospital labs so that we can do simulation training with our students, which is a new area in our field. Think about funding sources for graduate education for local students so that they could help the local um, workforce for speech language pathology. We also would like to expand the network of our alumni and community um, speech language pathologists who help us with our training. So we look forward to um, continuing to make uh, new connections and new relationships to benefit training for the university, but access for those across the lifespan who need our services. Great, thanks very much for that presentation of what you're doing. There'll be many threads we'll follow up later on, but thanks. Um, Tony, tell this crowd that knows you've been recognized for your work over the decades in community service learning, what they should know about your work right now. Well, I think the one thing uh, that's really important to remember about this place is that it, almost everything that we do started with students. It was their idea to bring forward a graduation requirement. It was their idea to start a mentoring program that started in the late 80s. Some of our little buddies now are in their mid-40s. Um, it was their idea to start Roots and Shoots, um, a program that Jane Goodall was very pleased with because we have a college student component working with elementary schools. Our, um, 
graduation requirements started in 1994 started with three students who really felt a need to go to Mexico and uh, work for Habitat for Humanity and we preceded the Jimmy Carter trip and we ended up basically digging the trains. But you would have thought we did something really spectacular because <laughs> they came back and said, we, we had such a good experience and the people of Mexico were so good to us, we think everybody should do public service while they're an undergraduate. So we performed another pilot course and those students enrolled in into the streets and it was another success and they went to the faculty assembly who did not have to approve this graduation requirement, but they went there. And so we were on, on the wave of this crest of national service ourselves. And Bill Clinton came into office and AmeriCorps was born and the Corporation for National and Community Service was born and all of a sudden we had our own graduation requirement. Started with three students and 30 years later we've, we've had tens of thousands of students and served hundreds of thousands of people and trying to connect undergraduates with the community um, isn't quite as challenging as you think. You just have to have really good partners and you have to trust that your faculty will help you when you get into a jam and can't quite figure out what you're doing. So our graduation requirement isn't just an individual um, internship in public service. It's also, it can also be fulfilled through a course that is taught by faculty and we have a very robust work study program where students are paid to work in nonprofit agencies and schools. And I don't think there's a school in town that we're not working at. There's not a school in the region that we haven't served. And beyond those, the experience of those three students back in 19, in the early 1990s, um, our students have gone all over the world. We, um, we see them doing service when they travel abroad. Um, in Africa and Salzburg. I mean, it's very diverse. It's very, there's, there's need everywhere. And the great transformative experience of service is just been such a rich experience for me professionally, but to see a young person who doesn't quite know what they're capable of doing and where they fit in, rise and meet the community to where it needs to be met has just been a blessing. So. That's where we're at, and we continue to grow our programs, and um, when a student creates something that we shepherd, uh, we put a lot of time and money behind it, and maybe one of the best things this school did is, is it went on hard money, and I say that because that was my job, so <laughs> I got paid. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much, and again, the many provocative leads you've laid out for us. Um, Renee, you are a specialist in many areas of public policy, but you're going to talk to us about one of them right now, which is the question of food insecurity and how we should think about the problem and the solutions. Right. So what is food insecurity and who experiences it? Food security involves having reliable access to nutritious food and having the money or credit to buy it. The U.S. Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity along a continuum. And on one end are people who worry and have anxiety about where their next meal is coming from or may not be able to access food. And they might limit their food choices so that, and that might lead to malnutrition. And then about mid-range, as you move up the scale, those who are moderately food insecure skip meals. And then by the time you get to the other end, you have highly food insecure people who within the last year have gone a whole day without eating food or more, or their children have. We know that black, Latinx, and Native American populations, as well as families with children, experience these conditions disproportionately. And the pandemic was, yeah. did a terrible job um, in tripling food insecurity rates. And the rates remain high. Here in San Bernardino, it's about 14% of the population, which is 307,000 people. Estimating who's on this continuum depends on a lot of factors. One is where do you live? If you're in an urban area more than a mile away from a grocery store, or in an, or if you live in a rural area more than 10 miles away from a grocery store, then you're in a food desert. And I mean, it's, imagine trying to put meals together with food from a 7-Eleven, all right? It also varies by employment status, 
whether you're able or disabled, and, the, and also by age. So those who are seniors are, are far more at risk. So newsflash, if we really want to solve food insecurity, we have to erase poverty. Well, um, that's a daunting task, but that's also why we need to work through national and state governments to coordinate responses at huge scales. In the US, it would be terribly inefficient to leave it just to nonprofits and charities to coordinate their fractional resources, even though they make great partners in supplementing uh, with their services. In fact, governments have been quite good at scaling up massive food assistance programs. You might be familiar with SNAP. It's called CalFresh here in California. But it's just not enough to meet demands. Solving food insecurity also means fixing problems at all stages of the food cycle. So from soil to stores to kitchens to landfill. It's a system in which 30 to 40 percent of all food is wasted. That's right, in the United States, 30 to 40 percent of all food. And one way we're addressing this here in California is with a new law to recapture unused food in schools and hotels and restaurants and to repurpose or redistribute it. About what 18 percent of what's in our landfills is just food waste. So how can you help and what can you do at home? Well, one, Stop being afraid of best buy dates, the BY, best buy. It's not the use buy, but the best buy dates. They're just put on there by manufacturers so that you'll have the tastiest, freshest food. So instead of throwing out your unopened cans and, and packaged foods, put them in a bag and put them online on a, on a giveaway site like Craigslist or Buy Nothing, and I guarantee within a few hours, someone will come and pick it up. Two, grow food and convince others to do that as well. If you don't have space, you can start with lettuce in a pot on your windowsill. You just have to remember to water it. And then maybe you can graduate to a community garden like the one we have here, our surf garden at, at Redlands. Or imagine this, replace part of your lawn with a vegetable garden, right? Imagine carrots and cabbage instead of pansies. And third, you can donate or volunteer, donate to or volunteer at a local food bank or food pantries. They're in churches, synagogues, and shelters all around our region. In fact, we have a food pantry right here at the University of Redlands. But they need you to help sort items and also to serve meals. So with adequate funding, innovative policies, and the cultural will to fix our food system, people can become more food secure, and we can attack these problems at the root. Thank you very much, Renee, for that clear and eye-opening um, presentation, and thanks for emphasizing food waste, which just is, is an enormous issue. I'm going to go out of order in asking this next follow-up. I'm going to go back to you, Renee, mm -hmm. just to, this is something you and I discussed before. Right. How should this audience think about the coexistence of food insecurity as a problem and obesity right. as a major public health issue? How can both of these things be true? Right. Well, it's, it's a system-wide level, but it also exists at the individual level. At the system level, macro level, we have a lot of policies in the United States that encourage the growing of corn. And that one of the biggest byproducts is high fructose corn syrup, and it's in our food everywhere. We don't even realize it. It's in bread, it's in yogurt, it's in a lot of very common food items. And we also, it's cheap food, but it's also very expensive medical care. I mean, that's the short answer, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have access to very cheap, inexpensive, but not nutritional food, which leads to obesity. So it happens, we encourage this at a, at a large scale, but it also happens that we're implementing that on, a, on an individual level. So it's very, it's possible to be food insecure and still be obese because the food you're eating is really not good for you. Thank you very much for, for clarifying that, which, which makes sense mm -hmm. once you point it out. It's a paradox, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go back to, to Tony, and, and we'll come back mm -hmm. th this way. So um, you've talked about the phenomenal growth in having a service for a University of Redlands, uh, Redlands students. What would be the key to making this go national? What if the whole country were learning from what you've done here? What would be the lessons the country would derive? Well, I... I would say that um, going on hard money is really one of the most important things. Uh, President Appleton did that for us. And the faculty. And, and spell out what you mean by that, please. Well, fund an office, and if you really want to do it, then pay people to help students succeed and be serious about it. And don't 
cut it out as soon as the budget needs to be cut. And so we've had presidents who, and deans who very much supported that. And this office, my office reports to both academic affairs and student affairs. And that's been a lovely marriage. But if other schools were serious about the, the potential of service learning and community engagement, um, they would have to put a little money behind it, but the, the growth of uh, student, the student life is phenomenal. And I mean, we have agency directors now who started their service through the graduation requirement. Mm. Um, we'll have appreciation luncheons and half of the room is full of U of R graduates running our nonprofits. So that's a direct impact. Um, so I think that would be the one thing I would say, you know, if you're gonna do it, be serious about it. And just to follow up specifically there, how much are we talking about per capita? If you're gonna use hard money to have an additional student have this, this requirement, how much money would a, does a school need to invest? Well, it depends. I mean, we started out, um, I was squeaking by, you know, but you, you need to, you can start with graduate students and then you grow your program with your graduate students like we did, and then paraprofessionals and then professionals. You, would, you could do this for fifty to $100,000 if you were very serious about it. You don't need a lot of money to volunteer, right? What you need is student energy and partners that care about having college students at their sites. Thank you. So um, in whichever order you, you would prefer, Lisa and Julia, I'd, I'd like if you could put the work you're doing here in Redlands and San Bernardino County and in Southern California into perspective in a national level. Are other institutions coming to you to learn um, the lessons? Uh, is this, are you seen as having solved problems people are struggling with elsewhere? Or mm -hmm. how do people look at the work you're doing here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I would say we collaborate. So mm -hmm. programs that are like ours, um, there are about 20 in California currently. And it's interesting because it's cooperative and com competitive, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so we want to know what are they doing. We get ideas, creative ideas from other programs. Um, we, we kind of get a sense of pride. We're doing that a little bit in a smarter way than another program, perhaps. But then we're like, oh, but they're doing this. So I think it's definitely a complex mix. What do you think, I, Julie? I think so, too. I think because of the, the training requirements, programs within California nationally really help each other mm -hmm. and uh, consult with each other and, and talk and communicate on how, well, how are you, how are you getting out into the community? And we, we're fortunate, I think, that we, we feel very supported by the community. Yep. Um, we just need to to come up with the creative ideas and, and pitch them, and they seem to be picked up, which mm -hmm. is great. And yeah. is there an illustration of something that you all have devised or uh, shown its success here in this local area that the audience should know about as a Redlands uh, tried and true solution? I think the Truesdale Center yeah. are, mm -hmm. has been here for over 50 years, yeah. and we've, we've seen uh, individuals across the lifespan and it's it's a working clinic five days a week it's humming over there so yeah. we're yeah, proud I, of that i would agree with that pride and and i think the comp competition comes in as julie was saying about placing students in the work they'll be doing in their career we need you know to have the slp supervise slps so yeah. they need to give back and then we need to know of those placements that's where it gets a little tricky with uh with that so. So here's a question I didn't prepare any of you for, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. The students you've had in the last two years have been living in the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic. How has that affected their outlook, as far as you can tell, in wanting to deal with these systemic problems, uh, whether, you know, starting with, with food insecurity? Well, one of the ways that we've dealt with it system-wide here is to actually institute a food pantry, yep. right? Um, so I think that we're becoming more aware of just this condition among us, right? And trying to do what we can to address it. But I think also addressing it involves destigmatizing it, mm -hmm. right? And enabling students to access what they need. And then, of course, getting everybody to pitch in to, to keep it stocked and so forth. But, mm -hmm. um, but dealing with it, I, people deal with it in different ways, to be sure. Um, but I'm, I'm glad at least we've done it yeah. in this way on our campus. And, and just to press that for, for a second more, is there a way which the circumstances of two years of dislocation have made students more fatalistic or more engaged? Oh, boy. 
Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think it's both. Uh, Tony, what, what's your experience with service in the time of pandemic? Um, they really rose to the occasion virtually, yeah. serving um, as best they could um, through programs like humanitarian mapping or tutoring with school districts. We have uh, several tutorial programs of our own and mentoring programs of our own that we went right online. We were, we were one of the first programs open. So they rose to that occasion um, and did all sorts of creative things outside where it was a bit safer. Yeah. That it has affected them, though. Um, I'm seeing um, they're, they're starting to come out of it. They're seeing the light. Um, but service is a good medicine, yeah. even online. So I've, I, I see some progress there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Lisa and Julie, I'm going to switch you to the roundup session of what is the main thing mm -hmm. you would like this crowd mm -hmm. to remember about mm -hmm. what your work and, and the way you've described it. We have a training program that has been supported by our community for years, and uh, we look towards future solutions to continue to work with the community locally and nationally um, as we train for more speech pathologists so that more individuals will have access to our services. Okay. Um, Tony, what's your main wrap-up message? Uh, I I believe that service has a place in higher education, and it, it blends the, the head and the heart in a beautiful way. And the outcome of that is the community embraces you, alumni help fund your program, and uh, students look back fondly at their experience. It's a very high impact practice. They stay in college. Mm -hmm. It matters to them. So I'm a little surprised that more schools haven't required public service. Um, but I'm really grateful that I work at one that did. Okay, thank you. And Renee. Well, there's a, one message that I couldn't cover earlier is just that there's a real urgency to addressing food insecurity. And children especially who are food insecure experience problems not just physically but mentally that stick with them for their whole lives. So the more that we can do as a society and also individually to address it, I think, is, is doing a good service for everyone. So I hope you all remember that. We've had a lot to celebrate today. I'd like to celebrate and congratulate these four leaders and the work they are doing to serve and address problems. So thank you all. <laughs> and we will all stay here where, while Evan, our MC, comes out to see us out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for coming to Red Talks and celebrating this very special inauguration day. I want to thank Shelley Stockton and President Newkirk for asking me to participate in today's event. Today's sessions will be available to rewatch online at redlands.edu. If you're planning to attend a dinner on the quad, that starts at 8 p.m. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you so much. <laughs>